thirdly, there's a major fear of changes to regulations and resource management. And on the right, you can see a couple of the quotes that we got, um, the first, both from directors of fishing management organizations. Um, first one, stressing the idea that unless industry insiders are actually consulted um, before decisions are made, they don't trust the information that they're given. Um, and the fact that they feel that they are more up to date in a way than the scientists are because of the fact that they're dealing on a day-to-day -day basis with um, things that are going on in the ocean. And secondly, um, from the second quote there, this idea that um, the development of offshore wind systems, um, which has certainly been mooted by the governor of California, um, could adversely affect the environment by perhaps um, reducing access to um, incoming or new exclusion zones. Um, and this will then also mean that the data cannot be collected on the same way that they've been collected previously. And so that will affect stock assessments. Next, please. Um, so we thought initially that our project would be of use to individual fishermen and you know, fishing companies. But in fact, it turns out that because of the way the, the fishery is regulated, this is actually unlikely. And so we are now changing more to think of how we can help uh, the regulators make sensible decisions for the benefit of all people in the industry. Um, so secondly, we found out that there's this need to compile this di these disparate data sets um, at that, so that they will be more use to everybody. And this has meant that we are now thinking about how to uh, produce data-driven decision-making tools in um, ways that are more comprehensive than just providing you with um, model output. Next, please. Um, so what we have done, we have now augment, or started our website, which you can see there. Um, I want to stress that this is still in development. Um, at the moment, we are capable of delivering um, various model results um, into informa it, as information that we hope uh, is useful to the community. Uh, for example, we are producing monthly maps, it says here, of physical, chemical, and biological variables. In fact, we haven't got the physical and chemical um, variables up yet, but we will shortly. Um, and this is based on a data set that stretches from 2015 to the beginning of 2025. So we have both timecast data and forecasts of what we think the system is going to look like in the in the near future involved and fishery stakeholders um, and without this two-way interaction um, we're not going to get anywhere and we don't think we're likely to be of use to you next please um, as examples this is um, based on this is one of the monthly uh, maps that we can produce um, this is for benthic invertebrates um, which and, and, and it uh, suggests that this was the distribution in February of 2018. Uh, the scale is um, in the top right is actually in grams per square meter. This may not be the best way to um, show it, but if not, please let us know and we can probably change this. Um, and at the moment, you can uh, pick a, a date. Um, and you can pick a class of um, fisheries um, that you want to look at. And, and we have about seven or eight classes, and we can produce maps on a monthly basis, as I say, for this 10-year period. Next, please. Uh, this is a forecast for November 2024 of small fish in the area. Similar to the last one, but as I say, a different fish this is a forecast, not a hindcast. And so um, 
we have this ability now to look two or three years into the future, and we would like to expand that further. Next, please. Okay, so what's next? Well, we need to do some more interviews. Um, we want your feedback, without which, as I've said, we can't develop our tool properly, and we won't know if it's useful or not. Um, we have to develop these tools, which again depends on the feedback. And of course, we need to search for continued funding. Uh, we're hoping to get phase two funding from NSF, which will keep us going for another two years, uh, but um, and, and also allow us to move from our current um, set up to a much higher um, reproduce. Uh, blah a much higher resolution mode than we have at the moment with dealing in 10 kilometer scale. Uh, at the moment, we're dealing in a roughly 100 kilometer scale. Um, so this search for continued funding is, is a major issue. Um, I've already approached NOAA management, but I have not heard back from them yet. Okay, next slide. So that's it at the moment. Um, I'm happy to try and answer questions if you have them. Um, if you don't want to ask them now, but you think of them later, you have my email. Um, please look at the website and um, let us know if it's likely to be useful to you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Chapman. Are there any questions for Dr. Chapman on his presentation? I'm not uh, seeing any, but folks, you have Dr. Chapman's contact information there, so you can reach out uh, directly. We have one other person signed up for public comment, Lindsay Triba from Kearns and West. Hi folks, this is Lindsay Triba. Can you all hear me now? We can. Great, thank you very much. And I, ha I believe I have 10 minutes, but please correct me if I'm wrong on that. All right, I'll go ahead and get started then. Hi everyone, again, my name is Lindsay Triba and I'm an associate with Kearns and West in Sacramento. And today I'm speaking to you on behalf of the Reorienting to Recovery Collaborative Salmon Recovery Effort that has recently gotten underway throughout the Central Valley. Um, so it just started back in 2001 and some of you may have heard some of the information um, through different presentations before, but if not, I'm going to join today to provide a very brief overview of the project with a goal of inviting you all to join the upcoming two hour deep dive project webinar that's happening on March 30th from nine to 11 a.m. Um, so don't worry about keeping all that information in your head. We have posted our project FAQ, one pager and webinar flyer to the public comment section on the website of this meeting. Um, and if I'm allowed, I can also drop in some information to the chat after I'm done here. So let me provide you with a brief overview of the project. The project is funded by state water contractors and the Delta Science Program, and it is led by representatives from various NGOs and public water agencies. And the project was also convened at the direction of CSAMP, uh, which as you may know, stands for the Collaborative Science and Adaptive Management Program. And the project itself is scheduled through 2024. So what exactly is this project? <laughs> well, basically it's this opportunity to convene together lots of different salmon and steelhead scientists throughout the entire Central Valley to use a structured decision-making process to identify implementable actions to meet science-based recovery targets throughout three distinct project phases. Um, and of course, we recognize that there are many fantastic salmon recovery projects already underway throughout the state. And this project does not seek to replace any of these projects. Rather, we're hoping that we can actually map the projects that are going on right now and find ways to tackle actions for recovery that address a cohesive Central Valley effort um, rather than individual watershed sheds. So trying to bring all of these efforts together. So in phase one, um, which ended at the end of last year, we convened 12 workshops over about four months with CSAMP scientists and agency representatives to identify a recovery definition framework 
using the viable salmonid population parameters um, that were established by NIMS, which are abundance, productivity, diversity, and spatial structure. And if you'd like to hear more about our recovery definition framework, uh, we encourage you to attend the upcoming webinar. But just to give you a little overview, uh, the framework is covering biological objectives, metrics, targets and target approaches, species and runs, and time and spatial scales. So we just have entered phase two of the project, which is the outreach and engagement stage. So we've been going around joining regional meetings just like this one to try to spread awareness of the project and share different ways to get involved. Um, and again, this is a very brief overview and I'm sure there'll be many questions, which is why we encourage anyone who is interested in salmon recovery, whether it's in a specific watershed um, throughout the entire Central Valley or of course on the Pacific Coast, to join our upcoming webinar on the 30th to learn more about the project, um, the various phases, the recovery definition framework that we've been working on, and ways to get involved. So if you're interested in giving involved, um, after the webinar, you can continue to engage in the process. So I'll just run through a few ways right now. Over the next few months, we're going to be asking folks who want to get involved um, to do one or two or all of the following things, depending on you know, your interest and your availability of getting involved. So one way you could do this is by providing data sets specific to your watershed that we will then use in modeling activities in phase three of the project and we have a modeling team um, for those activities. Another way to get involved would be to share your current and planned projects in your watershed for the creation of that Central Valley wide project catalog so that we have a better idea of what's going on, who's running these projects and how we can create this cohesive effort. A third way to get involved would be to share your perspectives on values related to salmon recovery in a workbook that we're going to be sending out at the beginning of April after that webinar at the end of March. And a final way to get involved, um, and this would be the most intensive way, would be to actually join one of the project teams. And we're going to have a structured decision making group where you go through this process of multiple meetings uh, throughout this summer or to join the science team, which will convene to actually review all of the data sets that have been provided um, and think about what's actually feasible, what's viable and go through the best um, way to reach these recovery actions. So I know that was a lot of information. Um, once again, you can find all of this information on the project FAQ or one pager or the webinar flyer, which again are posted on the public comment section of the website. Um, and if it's all right, I can also drop in our chat here, our website, um, as well as my contact information. So you can reach out to me with more information. And I, I will thank you very much for allowing us to join and give this brief presentation. And I welcome any questions right now if you have any. Thanks. Yeah, thank you, Lindsay. The, the chat features for technical issues, but I do think your information is available uh, in your submitted written comments. Yes, yes, that's correct. Um, let me see if there are any questions for Lindsay on the presentation from Kearns and West. Mr. Kern. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Uh, just uh, maybe half comment, half question, but um, again, this is all new to me. Um, appreciate you bringing it to us, but it, it does have a, at least on the surface to me, a lot of similarities to the Columbia Basin partnership process that occurred mm -hmm. several years ago. Uh, I assume that maybe I'm not tracking that incorrectly. And if so, are you, are you guys looking to that as um, potentially a model for effective versus maybe ineffective parts of that process? Absolutely. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and we spent a lot of time at the beginning of this process looking at the Columbia Basin model and some members of our team were actually um, tracking that or involved in that process as well. I would say one of the main differences between the Columbia Basin project and our project is we're going at it from a more scientific and technical aspect um, and we're including modeling components and um, diving in more through uh, the data sets. And one thing I didn't get involved in this brief presentation was also the fact that we're working with the CVPIA um, model as well as some other models. Um, so there are some differences there, but it's a, you know, the Columbia Basin project is a fantastic project to look to for best practices and lessons learned. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. 
further questions of Lindsay? Uh, I have a question for you, Lindsay. Um, sure. I noticed that in your frequently asked questions, you make reference to a viable salmonid population, which basically means one not at risk of extinction, which from the perspective of our fisheries that we manage is a pretty low bar since we want abundant fisheries, not those that are merely not at risk. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And then you elsewhere say it's not related to the CVPIA's doubling goal. Um, and the implication there is that you're seeking to go beyond the doubling goal. So I, I see that as somewhat confused messaging and hoping you can clarify that. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a great question. Um, so just to provide more background, what we're really hoping to do is use the projects, use the modeling set and use all of the brilliant papers and information that's out there um, kind of as the baseline. But the reason why we're not, why we want to go beyond um, the doubling goal and some of the other recovering goals that are out there right now is because we recognize there are many different ways to look at salmon recovery. Um, and to your point, it's not just at the baseline of the VSP, the viable salmonid population parameters. Um, and, and we believe there are more values and perspectives to look at. So it's not just going to be, you know, the baseline of doubling goal. It's also looking at, um, the diversity objectives, the spatial structure, abundance, productivity, and involved in our process. Uh, we have, as I mentioned, NGOs and the public water agencies, but we're also, we've been talking to um, recreational fishers, industry fishing groups. Uh, we have various California Native American tribes involved in the effort as well, um, in addition to the state and federal agencies. And so we want that broad scope process, um, which is why we're doing that structured decision-making process or SDM process for short, to make sure we're getting those voices involved so that we can actually prioritize values. Um, and we have not prioritized values that yet. That is what is coming up in phase two. Okay, thank you very much. It just, this, you know, it's just a salmon meeting and our salmon fisheries have been struggling and um, uh, I think a lot of people look forward to more abundant fisheries. Uh, Chris Kern. Yeah, thanks, um, mm -hmm. Mr. Chair. And I, I have a, I, I'm going to make a comment and ask if this is consistent with what um, this project is is envisioning. But my familiarity with viable sum on a population process is that it typically has multiple categories of viability rather than just one or two, ranging mm -hmm. from very low to very high. And so while it does measure risk, it also typically has different stages with the goal to being to reach either a viable or highly viable um, position in a lot of places. So I guess the question would be just, um, is that consistent with this project? And yes. Sort of that's, yeah. the, that's what's envisioned. That's, that's exactly right. Thank you for putting that together more eloquently than perhaps I answered the previous question. So I appreciate that. Exactly. There's going to be a different spectrum or scale of what's possible. Um, and that's why this process isn't just looking at, you know, the, the NIMPS outline. We're going beyond that. And the goal is to have more than just the bottom line, more than just um, a viable population. We want an abundant population. Did that answer your question? Does it answer your question, Chris? Okay. Any further questions <clears throat> of Lindsay? Thank you very much, Lindsay. Yeah, thank you. Thank you to you all. We hope to see you at the webinar so we can continue answering these great questions. And we'll have the technical team on the webinar um, so they can go into more of the scientific background than I'm able to today. So bring your questions ready and they look forward to speaking with you. All right, that concludes uh, open public comment uh, and takes, takes us to our next agenda item, administrative matters. And I am more than pleased to physically hand the gavel to our vice chair, Brad Pettinger. Uh, thank you, thank you uh, Ch Chair Grolnick. And uh, we are running late and we'll get right to it here. So I'd look to uh, Carrie Griffith to, uh, to uh, take us off on the C1. Carrie. Yeah, hello. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Vice Chair, uh, council members. Uh, this is agenda item C1, the report of the Office of National Marine Sanctuaries. Uh, they are good enough to come to the council every year and provide a comprehensive update on activities and upcoming 
um, um, act activities such as management plan reviews and condition reports and things like that. Um, I think that we have uh, Bill Duros online. I didn't scan through the um, the panelists, but um, he uh, is ready to give us the report. Uh, and there's a presentation that um, that uh, he'll share the slides with. I also want to alert you that there's two supplemental reports, one from the CPSAS and one from the GAP on this. Um, and so uh, after my overview and after we ask uh, Mr. Duros to give his presentation um, on the, um, the National Marine Sanctuaries Office, then we'll go to the advisory bodies um, reports and then public comment. And then your action today is just council discussion. Uh, and that concludes my overview. Thank you, Kerry. Uh, questions for Kerry on his overview? Okay, seeing that. Bill, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Can you guys hear me? Yes, we can. Oh, great. <clears throat> well, thanks once again for this opportunity to give you guys, you the council, an update and the larger council family. Um, we, we do appreciate this. We think it's been a very productive interaction that we've been having through these regular updates and you know we we put a lot of time and effort into it um you've got a written report from us and so i'm going to just walk through a powerpoint presentation that hits on some of the highlights from that written report but if you've got questions that i don't cover uh, at the end that's fine and um i mean it's a little tougher and that we can't see each other but i don't mind if anyone wants to stop me in the middle of the presentation if you have a question that's really urgent if that's okay with the chair so let's go to the next slide. Um, some of this is uh, just the first few slides are our background, uh, just so that in case there's any new council members or folks in the public that aren't aware of kind of what's the purpose of this. But um, for 15, 20 years, we've been really working hard. We, meaning Office of National Marine Sanctuaries, we're in NOS within NOAA, National Marine Fisheries Service on the West Coast, including the Science Center staff and the council to just to continuously make progress on improving our communication and our coordination and our overall working relationship. Um, we think it's really been rock solid and this process is important. And so there's some information I'm gonna to touch on regarding new Marine Sanctuary nominations, um, condition reports, which are reports we put out as precursors to management plan review processes. I'll talk a little bit about climate change. And then there's a couple of research activities that are worth highlighting. They may not be directly PFMC centric, but they help to highlight the kind of work that we're doing with um, state partners and others that are really helping this ecosystem that fisheries depend on. So how about the next slide? So just in case you know, you're not familiar with what sanctuaries are, these are uh, you know, marine areas, and that includes the Great Lakes waters that are set aside um, with a special consideration for their recreational value or their ecological or historical, cultural, archaeological value. Um, and we have some, some broad mandates within that. One is to raise public awareness and understanding through education and outreach. A second is to improve management of these areas through research that either we do or coordinate with others. That could include research, research on historical issues, social science, and then, of course, conservation science. Um, the sanctuaries help coastal economies by promoting and protecting uh, the healthy ecosystems and the resources that so many different um, entities depend on, whether those are commercial or recreational fishermen, scientists, of course, depend on it, and, and recreational opportunities depend on it. And then uh, we facilitate all kinds of public uses that are compatible with this broad goal of resource protection. And to us, that includes fishing, too. So uh, next slide. This map just shows you sort of where things are at these days within the National Marine Sanctuary System. Um, there are 15 sanctuaries around the country. Um, we have three that are going through a designation process, although one of those at Papa Namakuakea would be a sanctuary that would um, overlay an existing marine national monument. So it doesn't create any new area, it just creates an additional designation status. Um, and the total area protected within these sanctuaries is around 600,000 square miles. So it's a pretty large system in terms of area, pretty small compared to things like the 
national park system or the wildlife refuge system in terms of number of units. But it is by area quite a bit bigger than both of those uh, other federal protected programs. Next slide. So a uh, new sanctuary nominations um, gets a lot of attention sort of wherever we go. It is, I know that the Fishery Management Council has wanted to be kept apprised of what's going on. So um, the report itself, and I'll have a few slides that just give you something a little bit bigger than just here's, you know, the California, Oregon, Washington coast. But um, we have in the inventory some candidate sites um, that are in the inventory and could potentially be designated. Um, but we have two sites um, that have already been designated from this new process that was started in 2014. Um, one is in Maryland, one is in Wisconsin. Um, there's a nomination under review at this time. Um, that's a different Pribilof Island. The St. Paul area is the focus, but it includes St. George. We'd already had um, a St. George nomination in the uh, inventory already. And then there's these three designations in process. And I'll talk a bit more about Chumash Heritage, because that is in this region. Um, in Lake Ontario, in New York, and then, as I mentioned, Papanamakuakea. And then there's been four or five um, proposals, nominations that we have declined that we didn't think met the criteria. I've listed just a couple here. Most recently, one in Michigan, and then a couple others here on the West Coast, one that would have protected a number of offshore banks in Southern California, and then, well, not part of the PFMC, but the North Pacific Council. Um, we, we received the nomination for a huge area off the Aleutian Islands and most of Western Alaska, and we declined that as well. So it's been an active process to have this mechanism in place for community groups to submit proposals. Um, and some of those have come in from the West Coast, and we're now in the process to designate one. So if we can go to the next slide. Um, I'll talk about a Chumash heritage. In the last couple of updates that I've given the council, I've talked about Chumash heritage. You can see it in this map. It's the uh, sort of pink colored area between Cambria um, and then down to the Gaviota coast. Um, there's a blue area that the federal government's pursuing and the state of California wants to see developed for offshore wind. The sanctuary boundaries would not include that, <clears throat> but um, it's it, we're we're early on in the process, and um, it well it's been in the inventory since 2015. We didn't begin the process to designate it until November 10th, 2021, and we had a about a two month comment period that we extended for another three weeks at the request of fishermen and um, harbors in central Central California to give them more time to comment, um, and. Uh, we hope to, the, the rough game plan is uh, by the end of 2022, so maybe in you know 10 months time, we think we can have the draft documents on the street for public review. And those draft documents would include a draft management plan, a draft set of regulations, and then an environmental impact statement that would look at the impacts of the designation as well as alternatives to what's been proposed. So this, this area that's in in uh, sort of pink color here is the proposed area, but we, on a normal course of action to ensure we've got an adequate NEPA document, would look at boundary alternatives that are bigger and smaller, um, what, what's called a reasonable range of alternatives that help meet the main objective of the designation. So that's been um, a focus over the last month as we've been digesting this roughly 22,000 comments. Um, there was a lot of feedback that we received about offshore wind um, a lot about oil and gas, as well as uh, tribal collaborative management and co-management approaches. Um, and, you know, that, that's obviously a central part, but not the sole focus of this sanctuary. It was proposed by uh, one band of the Chumash, but it's supported by all the bands of the Chumash. Um, uh, and yet there's another tribal group there, the Salinan tribe, that's um, not in favor of the name for sure at all. Um, but uh, there's two bands of the Salinan. One is seems clearly in favor of a sanctuary, but not in favor of the name. So we got a lot of issues to work through, um, you know, such as, you know, how do we handle offshore wind, any additional offshore wind, the state and the and Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, as well as the wind industry has asked for that. Many fishing, fishing groups have been 
when clear, no more wind. This is the only wind area that's here in blue that should be developed while also expressing concern about the sanctuary. They're also concerned about offshore wind and you know, permanently locking out oil and gas, uh, et cetera. So the one thing we may be doing over the next month are some um, public workshops to work on and get feedback on action plans that make up the elements of the management plan itself. So you may see information about that coming that would probably be in the April timeframe. So that's Chumash. And if you go to the next slide, I just want to give the council a little bit of information about a new sanctuary that was added in June. So since I was last um, in front of the council in March, um, we finished the rule to uh, designate the Wisconsin Shipwreck Coast National Marine Sanctuary the second sanctuary in the Great Lakes. The other one's over um, in Lake Huron. This one's in Lake Michigan off Wisconsin. And it's uh, almost a thousand square mile area that's focused on um, shipwrecks, 36 known and significant shipwrecks in the area and almost twice that that are suspected to be in the area that need to be researched. And what we found with uh, Thunder Bay National Marine Sanctuary, the other existing one in um, in the Great Lakes is that this deep, cold, fresh water can lead to long-term preservation of uh, shipwrecks, many of which were wooden, you know, 100 years or so ago. Um, and so there's some exceptional historical and archaeological uh, resources there that are also important from a recreational standpoint for divers. So I just wanted to give you that update that that sanctuary's been designated um, on the, you know, to the east of us in the Great Lakes. Next slide. So the written report we have gives you more detail. I'm just hitting on the highlights of the condition reports. These are um, every five to 10 years, an assessment of the status and trends and the health of important components of the uh, sanctuaries that we manage. Um, and so that can include both habitat um, issues like water quality, um, as well as important species categories um, like intertidal resources or, um, or forage fish. And so we, produce these assessments with tremendous amounts of input from other um, managers, federal managers, NIMFs, um, the state of Washington, the state of California here on the West Coast, uh, many academic scientists all contribute their sort of best of information that leads to a consensus report on the status and trends. And we just on Monday um, released the report for Olympic Coast. Um, and, and that covers a period you know, through, you know, 2021, but the report was issued February 2022. Cordell Bank, we may have that one out in a year. There's some public workshops that are, have already happened and a few more that are coming. And we'll be starting Greater Fairlawns. In some ways, have begun the very first steps of that. And we'll be starting that review um, later, later this year. And so these um, are really important. We use um, tools like IEA indicators that our, our team in sanctuaries and your team in the National Marine Fisheries Service have helped develop together. And we've got a new analysis that we try to include in all of these that includes ecosystem services. So the written report has links to those uh, reports themselves. And I encourage anybody to grab that written report and follow up because there's just a tremendous amount of very detailed and useful information um, about these condition reports and what's the health and status and trend going on in the sanctuary. Next slide. As I mentioned, we use those condition reports as a precursor to updating management plans. <coughs> Excuse me. And so, um, again, since we last met a year ago, um, we've published the final management plan for Monterey Bay Sanctuary. That was about a six or seven year process to update that plan. There were very few regulatory changes in there, but some things that maybe council members are interested in. One was to um, adjust the definition of uh, dredge material that, so that would allow for that to be reused um, uh, for beach nourishment and habitat restoration. That mainly affects Pillar Point Harbor in San Mateo. Um, the other harbors in Monterey Bay Sanctuary, Santa Cruz, Moss Landing, and Monterey all have a mechanism that they've used for years to dredge in the harbors and dispose of that in the sanctuary where it's clean and can help nourish beaches but uh, Pillar Point still needed some additional flexibility and we've given them that. And there's also a, a mechanism um, to improve the 
personal watercraft use for tow and surfing that we've included in the regulations and some better designed zones for where MPWCs can be used in the sanctuary. There's some new uh, action plans in that, uh, climate change, marine debris, coastal erosion being several to highlight. And these do intersect from time to time with issues that the councils in the past, certainly the state of California has found important regarding marine debris removal. Sometimes that's old fishing gear and coastal erosion where some of the past sort of knee-jerk restoration efforts was harming kelp forests. A Channel Islands Management Plan Review, the draft was published on December 17th and we just closed that comment period. There are no regulatory changes in there, like Monterey Bay, nothing that uh, directly or indirectly um, adversely impacts fisheries, uh, but we have similar new action plans, marine debris and climate change like for Monterey Bay and Channel Islands has adopted a new action plan on introduced species. And then Olympic Coast, um, since we just completed that management plan, I'm sure, sorry, that uh, condition report, that uh, process will get going later this year. Um, and uh, that includes working closely with the Olympic Coast Intergovernmental Policy Council uh, to make sure we're on the same page about how to kick off that review. But probably by the end of 2022, maybe early 23, we'll be um, in full uh, scoping mode to get the Olympic Coast Management Plan review process off the ground. So these have been in the past areas of sort of uh, heightened attention between sanctuaries and the council. And so I wanted to highlight those for you, show you, you know, very clearly where we've got issues that may um, affect fishing, in this case, none of in these last couple of management plans. Um, but I know it's something that the council and, and a lot of the broader constituents are always keeping an eye on. So that's just sort of the timing for these. Again, the written report has links and you can see, for instance, the draft Channel Islands plan or the final Monterey Bay Sanctuary plan from that written report. Next slide. Uh, climate change is uh, getting a lot of attention and, and I, I flagged this in the past, so I'll, I'll go really quickly through this. We do produce um, climate change vulnerability assessments and for Olympic Coast, we're gonna try something uh, new given that we are just you know, we're very sure, very clear, very focused, all of us are on um, the realities of climate change, yet when we don't know really where those will take things, the climate change vulnerability assessment at Olympic Coast, we're in the process of doing right now, we're looking at a dozen or more species and six or seven habitats and ecosystem services that could be affected by climate change. And we want that plus the condition report to help inform the management plan review process. So we've done one already for uh, Greater Fairlands and Cordell Bank. Um, you, you, you've got that link to that in the written report. We'll be starting one for Monterey Bay and Channel Islands maybe in 2023, uh, 2024. But, but they are really helpful because, you know, a lot of these key species that we identify are either keystone species that are important commercial species. And, and we're not trying to, you know, get uh, anywhere near the business that the council's in, but the reality is that climate does affect things like salmon. It does affect things like abalone and other intertidal species when it just gets warmer and warmer, both the air temperature and the, and the, um, the water temperature and uh, recruitment, et cetera, can be affected. So we want to know look, what, what's the best science on where things may be going within these ecosystems that we're managing as a sanctuary. And then there's another report that came out in fall of 21 you may be interested in. The Greater Fairlands published that looks at blue carbon, this concept of, you know, how is it that carbon can be stored in these coastal ecosystems? And it's a two-part report, but, you know, part of the focus is on kelp and how important kelp is in locking up and, and ultimately sequestering that carbon in the deep sea when 10 to 15 percent of the kelp that's grown in uh, these near shore, you know, large kelp forest systems end up in really deep water and uh, have a really long lag cycle to get back into the atmosphere. And the same is true for whales, believe it or not, um, probably easy to believe. They eat a lot of things that have carbon and they ultimately die and sink to the seafloor. And that as well moves carbon out of, um, you know, a, a, an interaction phase with the atmosphere. Um, seagrass beds and wetlands do that as well. So anyway, that report is there if you're interested in looking at how a place-based, pretty large place-based management program like a National Marine Sanctuary here on the West Coast can help improve blue carbon 
sequestration and you know what are its limits as well. Next slide. Uh, these couple of research projects I wanted to mention, the, the die off of kelp <clears throat> north of San Francisco and to some extent south of it into Monterey Bay um, has been a really significant issue. There's a lot of folks working on this. Um, we in um, particular Greater Fairlawns and Monterey Bay Sanctuary are working on it, flagging one project Fairlawns is doing. And again, these are projects that are done in tandem with state fishery managers and scientists, as well as academics. And, um, and you may have heard a huge uh, interest is there in the public to participate. And so that includes mapping sites throughout Greater Fairlawns, 25 different sites, doing some sub title surveys at these, and ultimately I'm narrowing it down to four sites we've got initially that we think might be really good for restoration. Um, and so that's something that's gonna be moving out over the next year or two. Hopefully there's lots of talk of new funding. There may be some in the FY22 budget um, that we're hopeful for, and that'll allow us and partners to carry out work um, that a lot of folks are really focused on. Not that we can alone you know, outplant our way to the restoration of the kelp forests, but there's so much from a recreational and a commercial fishery standpoint that depends on healthy kelp forests. Anything from food for red abalone to nursery grounds and you know, refuges for small salmon as they exit big rivers like the Sacramento River. Um, and so we think it's really important to, to keep working on this. Next slide. A similar project that we've been doing with um, uh, California F Department of Fish and Wildlife um, it, it, I'm sorry, it's a different project, but a similar concept. Um, there's a lot of interest in culling urchins that are hyper grazing right now, have been for the last five years, these kelp forests. And so working with the Fish and Game Commission to make some adjustments to uh, sport fishing regulations and a group of about 50 divers, um, what these two tables show you is a particular reef where we're studying a couple things. This just shows you data from one of the studies in part, it's, um, again, consistent with what's allowed under fish and game law. How do we remove and reduce and monitor um, urchin density, both purple and red urchins, at one site called Tanker Reef that's right off Monterey Harbor? Um, and how low do we have to get it? How long will it take to get the populations low enough? The thought is you get down below two urchins per square meter, you have them low enough that natural recruitment of kelp will allow the kelp forest to recover. So we're testing that theory. And as I mentioned, 50 or so divers um, working over the course of a year um, of these, these two charts show um, the spring in a control site and, in, and a, a treatment site, spring of 21, fall of 21. It took some time to get those numbers lower. The control sites, they were unchanged by and large, but they're now low enough that we can perhaps see some restoration. This is just some uh, preliminary work that now the next couple of years is looking and seeing does kelp come back. Um, so I wanted to flag that research project too. And if you go to the next slide, <clears throat> a little bit of information about black abalone work that um, Monterey Bay Sanctuary is doing. Again, with the approval and blessing of Cal Fish and Wildlife and National Marine Fisheries Service that both have a management responsibility over black abalone because they're an endangered species. Some of these big fires in Big Sur, um, the Dolan fire followed by this massive atmospheric river event a year ago led to enormous um, flows of sediment into some of these coastal habitat areas. And so this one fi figure on the left was from February 21. And over the course of a couple months, this area was excavated, exhumed to um, uncover abalone that we knew in advance were there, black abalone that are, this is in the um, sort of mid to lower um, low tide uh, re re region. And about 200 abalone had been removed, 160 were either immediately healthy enough to be translocated to sites or went back to a lab and were later brought back um, and um, relocated elsewhere in Big Sur. So this has been a really important project to you know, be out there trying to do what we can so that we can keep that black abalone from, um, you know, really declining to the point where they're like white abalone, where we're struggling even to find them. We think it's working. There's a lot of, you know, helpful effort. And while 160 abalone may not seem like much, you know, it, it and it is frankly a ton of effort for two or three people to 
over the course of some tide cycles, dig them, dig them out. It's important when they're, you know, pretty rare to get them out into other healthy habitat that hopefully is going to stay healthy for a long time to come. And I think I've got one main slide left, maybe, maybe two, two slides left. You can go to the next one. Um, I, I want to out, out, uh, identify some outreach highlights for the year. Um, this is the 50th anniversary for the National Marine Sanctuaries Act and a lot of other federal laws, the Marine Mammal Protection Act, I believe, <clears throat> the Clean, Clean Water Act. Um, and so anyway, there's, there's going to be a lot of things going on. And, and you, know, you may see where you live some opportunities or some information later in the year to get involved in activities um, here on the West Coast and elsewhere in the country. Um, and we just want to highlight the fact that it's been a long run, 50 years of conservation of these special places. And you know, we want another 50 years beyond that or more. Um, and then this picture on the right just shows you this exhibit. And I, I think I may have talked about it last time, but if any of you are down in Santa Cruz in like a couple months, we think maybe in a couple months we'll have that visitor center open there. Please go in. There's a really amazing exhibit we have in there that was a three panel project um, to help tell the story of Central California uh, salmon, California salmon in aggregate, but really focusing on the Central Valley. Um, and we've also then expanded that by partnering with the U.S. Forest Service to also help highlight how the national forests, especially in California, are critical to, to salmon recovery. So but go see that. It's, it's a way in which we, when I say we, it's we in the National Marine Fisheries Service, the Southwest Fisheries Science Center, um, was a lead in um, working through with us on, on the kind of information we want to use to tell a story through exhibits. And that's a visitor center that gets, you know, normally 40, 50,000 visitors a year. So we can, we can connect with a lot of people there. Um, and I hope if you're in the area, maybe this summer, you get a chance to swing by and see that exhibit. And then um, the last slide is just uh, identifying opportunities that are out there. Some of these we've been talking about, but, but things that we will be trying to do over the coming years. Um, there's this phrase of webinizing these condition reports and marrying those even more closely with NOAA IEA indicators and tools so that the, the condition reports aren't a static every five year thing, rather they can be updated real time and get real science information out there. Uh, we, we continue to see lots of opportunities for collaboration on um, climate change science and how we communicate that and get people aware of really how these changes are going to take place in these coastal ecosystems where folks live and where we've got marine sanctuaries. Um, offshore industrial development, really wind is the big discussion topic right now. And I know there's a lot of concerns with fishermen about you know, just how much wind is there really going to be on the West Coast and how uh, much, how great will that, extensive will that impact be? Is it an absolute closure, no fishing allowed in any way? on some of these, in and around some of these wind farms, and we're, we're involved in those as well. So uh, there's a couple other suggestions here, but the, the gist of it is that there are opportunities for us to be collaborating further. We often find those as the opportunities arise, and um, I think it's a good place to be rather than it's simply reactive and maybe sometimes defensive relative to a potential fishing regulation, which really doesn't materialize very often to these other important ecosystem-wide issues that you know, help all of us create a more healthy, sustainable, resilient ecosystem here in the California current. So that's the last slide I believe I've got. Yep, and I am happy to answer any questions and I thank you again for this chance to give you an update. Yeah, um, thank you, Bill, for a great report. Um, questions for Bill on the uh, sanctuary report? Um, Chair Grelnick. Uh, thank you, Vice Chair. Uh, Bill, thanks for a ter terrific report. I certainly, I'm a salmon guy, as people here know, and I'm looking forward to getting to your uh, visitor center. I do have a question on slide 14, um, the poster on California Salmonscape. Was that a Ray Troll work? Yeah. Yeah, Ray Troll did some of the artwork that went into that. Yeah, it's, it's terrific. Thanks. Yeah. Oh, okay. Further questions for Bill? Okay. Thank you, Bill. Um, I think we're going to keep going here into the reports. Um, I believe uh, Bill has to uh, leave at uh, early afternoon. So yeah, I got a couple hours. Yeah. So uh, with that, we're going to continue with the gap report and uh, Merrick McRae. Merrick. 
Hello, good afternoon, Vice Chair Pettinger, Council Members. Um, I'm Merritt McRae, and I'll be reading from Agenda Item C1B. The Groundfish Advisory Subpanel reviewed the briefing book documents under this item and others following, and offers the following comments. In general, the GAP opposes the designation of new large sanctuaries along the West Coast, and in California in particular. This follows a fisheries-wide sentiment. Most of California's coast from Point Reyes above San Francisco to the Channel Islands south of Santa Barbara already falls under sanctuary's authority. On the face of it, sanctuary designation could provide protection of fisheries from many competing uses fisheries face. These include hydrocarbon exploration and exploitation, at sea aquaculture, oceanic renewable energy development, wind farms, and others. However, over the years, experience has promoted, has, has prompted a greater fear of losing fishing access due to the efforts of sanctuary staff and regulations than is presented by the specter of competing ocean uses. In the case of the Channel Islands National Marine Sanctuary, in 1980, the designation efforts had gathered broad support by fishers. Fears of additional regulatory hurdles were mitigated by the inclusion of explicit language within its designation document, excluding CNMs from regulating fisheries. Yet by 2001, CNM staff had spearheaded a process designating the largest area of no fishing marine protected areas in the state, which remains so to this day. In 2006, CNM staff successfully endeavored to have the wording explicitly prohibiting CNMs from managing fishing stricken from its designation document. In the context of well-managed fisheries, science has shown perennial fishing closures of this scale and type offer little compensatory fisheries benefit and indeed model to cost fisheries production. Further, dynamic fisheries closures model to be much more effective at re reducing bycatch of species to be avoided. In the California case, Permanent closures have hampered our ability to survey and assess fish stocks along this coast. Fisheries independent data derived by marine protected area monitoring efforts have thus far not been able to be incorporated into stock assessments. Of course, there is no fisheries dependent data coming from these MPAs. Until sanctuaries establish a track record of an actual hands-off policy regarding fishing, leaving fisheries policy to the National Marine Fisheries Service and state wildlife agencies, these kinds of experiences leave the gap to support the statements seen in the public comment by the Alliance of Communities for Sustainable Fisheries at this meeting under this agenda item. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Merritt. Questions for Merit on the uh, GAP report? Okay, seeing that. Thanks, Merit. Um, Thank you. Next up is the um, S, uh, CPSSAS report and uh, David Crabb. David. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. My name is David Crabb, and I'll be reading supplemental CPSAS report one. In a joint webinar on March 1st, 2022, the Coastal Pelagic Species Advisory Subpanel and the Coastal Pelagic Species Management Team heard a presentation by Kerry Griffin about the National Marine Sanctuaries Coordination Report. The CPSAS also read the written report and we'd like to thank the Office of National Marine Sanctuaries for the report. The CPSAS has great concerns about the potential designation of the Chumash Heritage National Marine Sanctuary. The CPSAS agrees with the Northern Chumash Tribal Council stated view that the proposed sanctuary should not impose future sanctuary regulations that affect commercial fisheries or recreational fishing. The CPSAS appreciates the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration statement in the report stating, if NOAA anticipates needing sanctuary regulations that would regulate fishing, the sanctuary staff will bring any such need back to the PFMC for its consideration. Feedback or action. 
This premise should also apply to ancillary regulations that can have the effect of indirectly regulating and impacting commercial and recreational fishing activities. Examples could include regulations preventing bottom contact, the use of lead weights, anchoring, speed limits, vessel discharge, etc. Because regulations such as these may affect commercial and recreational fishing activities, the CPS AS recommends exemptions from such regulations for commercial and recreational fishing activities to the extent possible. The CPS AS would like to see the NOAA language in the report be expanded to include any changes that would affect any impact on fishing should be brought before the Council or California Fish and Game Commission for approval. Additionally, the CPSAS recommends the Council and Council staff continue to monitor the designation process of the CHNMS and comment where appropriate. And that uh, completes the statement. Thank you, David. Uh, questions for David on the CPSAS report? Okay. Well, thank you, Dave. Um, with that, that concludes our uh, Advisory bodies, and I don't see any public comment, which would bring us to uh, council action, which is discussing the uh, National, Marine Sanctuary, National Marine Sanctuary Service uh, activities. And so I'll open the floor for uh, any hands. Or not? Oh. Chair Gerlnick. Thank you, Vice Chair Pettinger. I just wanted to say that the concerns expressed by the advisory bodies um, about uh, direct or even indirect impacts on fisheries um, can be a source of concern, uh, even if regulating fisheries is not in the designation document. Um, it's still possible for regulations to indirectly uh, burden fishing activities um, and uh, that, that should be an area that we should continue to keep an eye on and be concerned with. Thank you, Chair Grodnick. Um, anyone else? Okay. Oh, Bob Dooley, Bob. Yeah, thank, <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. I, I would add, Mark, I appreciate those comments, but I also would add uh, the effect on the inability to do surveys and, and included in those fishing activities and how that how they impede our surveys and the in the validity and thoroughness of those surveys to count all of the species in the areas. So and we've seen that. So I would would like to make sure we address that as well. <laughs> Thank you, Bob. Um, Marcy Yaremko. Marcy? Yes. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um Hopefully you can hear me all right. I just want to uh, thank the uh, Office of the National Marine Sanctuaries uh, for the report. Uh, again, this year it contained a lot of uh, content describing a number of collaborations, uh, many of which involve uh, the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. I did want to flag one, uh, one comment in the report itself uh, surrounding the uh, Chumash designation process on page three, um, describing the timeline for the development of the draft management plan, the draft regulations, and the draft uh, EIS. And just noting that the report itself uh, suggests that this possibly may be complete uh, near the end of 2022. Um, it sounds like they're busy uh, assimilating uh, over 22,000 public comments received. Um, but I would just uh, encourage us uh, and our council staff uh, in coordination with the sanctuaries to keep our eye on the development of these documents. Um, I think acknowledging the um, the content in our AB reports and acknowledging the um, the importance of this process. I think uh, just want to highlight that um, it sounds like things are on a, a fairly fast uh, development track, and um, certainly I think uh, we look forward to being involved in the coordination of um, 
uh, development of comments and um, and such as those um, plans progress. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for that, Marcy. Um, okay, anyone else? Okay, no seeing, not not seeing any hands. I'll uh, I'll look to Kerry. Kerry, how are we doing? Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. I, I think you're good. Again, your action was just council discussion, and I think you had that discussion. And uh, I'd also like to express my appreciation to Bill Duros. Um, as you all know, we were uh, the, things were sort of um, on edge, waiting to see when he would go on, and council was a little bit behind. But uh, he really rolled with the punches, and I appreciate it. And I appreciate uh, IT staff help and all that stuff. So uh, anyway, I think you were good to go on this one. Thank you. Okay, wonderful. Thank you, Kerry. Uh, with that, that'll take us to our lunch hour. And um, we are running behind, but I think since we have a new restaurant here we're dealing with, and we're in person for the first time in a long time, we'll probably take the, the whole hour to make sure we're not late getting back to the floor. So with that, uh, we'd come back here at, uh, look to uh, say 120, and um, we'll get started off on, um, on D1. So we'll see everybody at, um, at 120.
and the underabundance of krill and juvenile rockfish, which are the common prey items for salmon. Hey, Steve, this is Chris Kleinschmidt, IT specialist. Can you hear me? Yeah, Chris, I can. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Check one, two. I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yeah, you're coming through. I don't know if Chris can or not, but uh, I can hear you. Oh, great. All right. We're good then, I hope. Hey, Steve, this is Chris again. Can you try one more time, please? Yeah, check one, two. Can you hear me? Yep, we got you. All so right. uh, we'll be able to just enable your microphone this way. Uh, if you happen to have a headset that's got a mic built in, that's always ideal versus talking at the iPad. But we can indeed hear you, and we should be good to go. All right. Even like just the basic Apple little headphone microphone, would that be better? Uh, yeah, I mean, you're coming through pretty decent, but it's just, it's one of those best practices things if you happen to have a set laying nearby. I'll dig it up. Awesome. Right. Thank you. Thank you.
Uh, just a quick check. Can you guys hear me? And if we don't have time for I can hear you, Bill. Great, thanks. Okay, we're gonna get started here shortly. <clears throat> okay, welcome back from lunch. Um, so we're a little behind here today, but we're hopefully to, hopefully to catch up. And um, so I'll look to, uh, to Robin to get us started on uh, D1. Robin. Good afternoon. Just trying to figure out what time of day it was. So good afternoon, uh, Mr. Vice Chair. This is agenda item D1, uh, the National Marine Fisheries Service Report. So the NEMS Northwest and Southwest Fishery Science Centers in the West Coast region uh, will give us a brief report on recent develop developments relevant to the salmon fisheries and issues of interest uh, to the council. Um, we do have uh, some uh, briefings on the research topics from those science centers. And those are uh, the supplemental D1A NEMS report one and two and in addition, we have Ms. Susan Bishop that will inform the council on the process of the salmon rebuilding plans, the status of the council's amendment process for the Sunk Coho, and consideration of a Southern resident killer well threshold for 2022. Is that in D1? Yeah, okay, so that, that topic is gonna be pushed to D3. But other than that, she'll also give us some updates on the status of current listing petitions. And her report is uh, D1B, NIMS Report 1. And from our advisory bodies, we also have a Habitat Committee report under D1C. And so your council action is just a council discussion uh, to hear what the science centers and the regulation process has been up to since we last met. And that concludes my summary. Okay, thank you, Robin. Uh, questions for Robin on her overview? Okay. Well, with that, we'll go to um, NIMS report one, and I believe it's Steve Lindley. Steve, are you there? I am, yes. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair, and good afternoon uh, to you and the council members. Hopefully, I'm coming through clearly. Uh, you are. Excellent. Yeah, it's uh, my pleasure today to update you all on some recent developments at the science centers that are outlined in more detail in supplemental reports one and two under agenda item D1A. Uh, I'm going to cover uh, a brief update on thiamine deficiency complex and application for a Magnuson-Stevens Act research permit. And then I'm going to hand um, 
the virtual mic over to Dr. Will Satterthwaite, who is going to um, talk a little bit about some concerns regarding Central Valley Spring Run Chinook salmon status and uh, their, their response to drought effects. Um, I'm not really going to talk about Supplemental Report 2, but you might want to peruse that at your leisure. It's a list of publications from the two science centers that have come out over the last couple of years in the peer-reviewed literature. And if any items on that list, uh, if you'd like to learn more about them, I can either get you those publications or I'd be happy to brief the council on any of those topics um, at a future meeting or bring in the scientists directly who are involved. If that's of interest, you can let me or Robin or Susan know about that and we'll figure that out. So um, NIMS supplemental report number one covers the other three topics and I'll start with the thymine deficiency complex situation. So a year ago, I briefed many of you on this new emerging issue uh, that's afflicting Central California Chinook salmon in particular. And you may recall that thymine deficiency complex is a lack of the vitamin B1, which we and all other forms of life need and only some can make themselves and most of us have to get it from our diet. Um, this was discovered in Central Valley uh, Chinook salmon hatcheries in tw the 2019 brood year. Uh, it, it appeared as swamp fry that were swimming erratically and then lying on the bottom of their raceways and then dying uh, in pretty alarming numbers. And it was found that giving these things a thymine treatment would um, cause them to rapidly recover. So this, this was a, an interesting new phenomenon of great concern and the centers have engaged in trying to understand what's going on with this. Um, so I have a few highlights. We've done a lot of work in the intervening year on this uh, with many, many partners really internationally at this, at this point in time. Um, Probably the most important question to answer, you know, is this going on? This was something that appeared kind of out of the blue, and um, we certainly hoped it would just go away. And I'm um, sad to report that it is not going away. It seems to be getting worse, in fact. So we saw the worst levels yet of thymine uh, deficiency in winter run Chinook salmon in the 2021 brood year. We saw um, this last juvenile outmigration cycle, about 44% of the production was expected to be lost due to thymine deficiency, due to post-hatch mortality. Uh, that's the worst yet. Uh, and that's on top of um, the, the poor uh, juvenile egg rearing conditions and out-migration condition, conditions that were happening relative to the drought, uh, which are a larger problem, but th this only makes things worse. Um, this is not affecting only winter run Chinook salmon, but it's been seen in Coleman National Fish Hatchery the McCallany River Hatchery and the Feather River Hatchery in their fall production programs, also in the Spring Chinook uh, production program at the Feather River Hatchery. Uh, it's not yet showing up in the Klamath River, really, in the Chinook there at all. So that's some good news. Um, we think that this is related to the rapid expansion and increase in abundance of northern anchovy, which started in 2018 and has continued apace. Northern anchovy are expanding northward uh, and overlapping more and more with salmon. And at the last survey, the Southwest Fishery Science Center CPS survey, they are abundant up to Cape Mendocino now uh, have, after having expanded out of um, Central California in 2018. Um, what's going on with anchovy? Maybe a couple different things. Anchovy are very lipid rich and in other systems, high lipid diets are associated with depletion of thymine reserves in fish. And um, to make matters worse, anchovy produce an enzyme called thiaminase, which destroys thiamine. And uh, a diet that's too reliant on anchovy without other sources of thiamine in it can result in extreme thiamine deficiency, which seems to be what we're observing. Um, in, the, in the diets, um, many salmon fishers will have noted that um, a lot of the fish caught were just packed with anchovy and very little uh, other prey items like krill or juvenile rockfish that that might be more commonly observed. Um, another bit of good news is that in the hatchery, this is readily treatable, and that is being done in most of the hatcheries for most of their production, um, either by giving thymine injections to the adults as they return, or uh, giving the eggs a bath in a thymine solution. And this is very effective at restoring thymine levels in the eggs, and the subsequent juveniles do just fine after that. Uh, in, in certain rare cases, it's possible to do that. 
for fish in the wild, for example, the Feather River Hatchery collects um, spring run Chinook salmon that come back early in the season and they're marked in a way that they can be, well, I guess, you know, they're spring run because of the time of year. They can be treated and returned to the river and allowed to spawn naturally. And we think that's effective, but there are, are not a lot of opportunities to do that elsewhere. So uh, naturally spawning fish are not likely um, to be treatable in any way we can really imagine at this point and maybe suffering subsequent losses of production. Um, we've continued to attract support from partners to fund this work. We're, we have a lot of work going on this year and um, we have money for a couple more years of monitoring egg thymine levels in the hatcheries that may be ongoing thanks to the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. And um, some of the things that we're working on are a little less directly applicable, but will give us a better understanding of what's going on that might point to some other strategies for managing this. Potentially, one of the things that we're going to be investigating this year is whether uh, the river water contains thymine that could be available to eggs that would help um, naturally produced eggs um, to recover thymine and maybe avoid some of this mortality. We've collected a lot of water samples throughout the Central Valley to, to look at that question. Um, I don't have any results yet for that to share, unfortunately. Um, we're also trying to understand how widespread and whether really anchovies are the cause of this by reconstructing salmon diets using stable isotopes of their muscles and eye lens tissues to uh, evaluate how different individuals have been feeding, what they've been feeding on, and whether that's related to their thymine levels. Um, and there is, are some inkling that the susceptibility to low thymine levels can vary among species and even stocks within species. So we're looking at that, uh, rearing eggs in a hatchery setting and looking at their success versus the level of thymine that they have available. Um, and then a, just a more basic research questions, trying to understand whether this thymine deficiency complex is mostly due to the thyminase activity of the anchovies that the salmon are eating, or whether it might be indicative of a lower trophic level problem or a broader scale problem in the ecosystem about thymine production and availability. So we've been looking at uh, everything from the, the seawater and the, the plankton at the base of the food web, food web and following this up. Um, so hopefully next year, I'll have uh, some updates on all of that. Um, I'm gonna skip then to the other item in NIMS Supplemental Report 1, or the, the middle item, which is a Magnuson Stevens Act research permit application that is um, under consideration, I believe, right now. And this is a collaborative project between UC Santa Cruz and the NIMS lab in Santa Cruz, where I work, to look at how water temperature and flow in the Central Valley affects the return migration of adult Chinook salmon. And the gist of the proposal is to capture 200 at most, adult Chinook salmon um, just in front of San Francisco Bay in the Gulf of the Farallons, and to, to tag them with acoustic tags, which would then allow them to be observed by an array of acoustic tag monitors that are throughout the Delta, San Joaquin, and Sacramento rivers uh, that allow us to see when and how the fish move back to their spawning grounds and how that might be relating to the flows and water temperatures which are you know, largely affected by the water project operations and whether the variation that we expect to see on that is related to the energy content of the fish. So we're gonna, we can measure that at sea, um, what stock they belong to, whether they were hatchery or natural origin and in their general, their, um, their health condition as well. Um, and again, with that, I can take questions on either of those topics before handing things over to Dr. Satterthwaite. Very good. Okay. Um, questions for uh, Steve? Oh. Um, Chris. Thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, Steve, just a, a quick note. I think um, ODFW's got some work going on with steelhead related to thiamine and, and this issue and have been doing some testing as well as um, I think experimenting with some therapeutic treatments. So if, uh, if your folks are on uh, the, the team that, that Noah and others that's working on this um, is interested um, in kind of comparing notes with those folks, we can certainly put you in touch with them. Thank you for that. I think we are somewhat in touch. I, I am aware that they've seen some of this in the steelhead production programs in Oregon. 
So I think we're a little bit connected with that. It's also a big concern in um, Alaska with Yukon River Chinook. As we're talking to people up there as well. Okay, thanks, Chris. Uh, Krista? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, just a quick question. Uh, a lot of the research is on the nutritional component, but I am wondering if uh, you've done and are continuing to do additional research on kind of the genetic component for parent-child offspring and, and their metabolism of that as well. So are we seeing any differential between stocks, et cetera, um, on how they're utilizing this that could be beneficial in, in how we're looking at nutrition? Yeah, that's a, a great question. I think right now that's limited to looking at the susceptibility of um, the fish to the, the thymine levels, basically developing a, a lethal dose response uh, to egg thymine and how that varies among different populations of Chinook salmon, which would could suggest genetic variability in this. It, the, this different stalks have different timings and, and marine distributions potentially. So their diet histories likely also differ. Um, I don't think we're yet thinking directly about um, a genetic analysis of that, although we have the samples and the technology to do that, which is a really uh, good idea. Okay, I'll, thank I'll bring that to my, my collaborators. All right, thank you. Thank you, Krista. Okay, Steve. Was Will going to do me next? That was the plan. Um, I think he was I available. See I see him there. Yep, yep All right. he is. Very thank good. you, everybody. Will. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. Will? Hey, uh, thank you. Um, See, so yeah, I'll be uh, going over the last part of this uh, D1A NIMS Report 1 uh, regarding some potential concerns. With respect to brood year 2020 of threatened Central Valley Spring Chinook, which will likely primarily be a potential issue for 2023 fishery planning, uh, but then identifying some potential work that might be done between now and then to help us make more informed or to help you make more informed decisions in 2023. Um, so there are multiple lines of evidence that suggest uh, brood year 2020 for Central Valley Spring Chinook could be um, pretty low abundance. Um, natural area spawning escapement in 2020 was the third lowest since 2001. Uh, that's shown in table B3 of the review of ocean fisheries. And then due to the 2021 drought conditions, we expect that that uh, 2020 brood year continued to experience poor conditions throughout the rest of its time in freshwater. So um, indicators developed for Central Valley fall run, which are likely to be you know, similar but not identical to what spring run is experiencing, um, are indicative of both poor um, incubation survival and poor survival during outmigration. And then some direct measurements of Central Valley spring Chinook outmigration survival that Cyril Michelle was able to make with tagged spring run fish uh, showed the lowest survival out of the eight years of data he had. Um, and then ocean indicators are a little bit more mixed, um, but overall, you know, a lot of lines of evidence suggesting that the brood year 2020 for Central Valley Spring Run could be low abundance. Um, and while Central Valley Spring Chinook is a threatened species, um, due to sort of a combination of data limitations and limited analytical capacity, we don't currently um, estimate what fishery impacts on that stock are. Um, nor are we able to directly manage impacts on that stock. Instead, it's sort of a proxy-based approach that um, uses um, the um, measurements or management measures in place for Sacramento winter Chinook, um, plus just other general constraints in the FMP. Um, given what we know about where the different stocks tend to go in the ocean and what their return run timing is, um, it's probably reasonable to assume that exploitation rates on centralized spring Chinook are probably higher than what winter run experiences, but lower, at least on an age specific basis than what Sacramento fall Chinook experiences. And so for the 2023 fishery management year, that's probably most relevant for this cohort, what the allowable impacts on the winter and fall Chinook stocks will be, will be driven by the forecast for the 2021 winter Chinook and the brood year 2020 Sacramento Fall Chinook. 
For the brood year 2021 Sacramento Winter Chinook forecast, um, that forecast is likely to be higher than it normally would have been under these sorts of environmental conditions because Livingston Stone Hatchery, which is the hatchery that produces winter run, um, produced about almost three times as many fish in 2021 as they normally do. Um, and then in terms of the um, forecast for brood year 2020 Sacramento Fall Chinook, the total levels of production of the hatcheries in brood year 2020 were fairly similar to typical levels, um, but there was an unusually high level of trucking fish with the hopes of you know, avoiding harsh river conditions and therefore increasing their survival. Um, and in addition, you know, Steve mentioned, there was treatment for this potential thiamine deficiency going on in both of those hatchery programs. Um, whereas you know, spring Chinook spawning in natural areas, aside from those that went into the Feather River hatchery are not gonna benefit from that same sort of treatment. And so taken together, this creates the risk that the Sacramento Winter Chinook and Sacramento Fall Chinook forecasts informing 2023 salmon management will not reflect the impacts of poor environmental conditions on natural origin productivity that Central Valley Spring Chinook are likely to experience. To better assess the likely magnitude of this risk, there is some technical work that could be done over the next year that could provide useful information to the Council for its 2023 deliberations. Information on the separate contribution of hatchery versus natural origin fish to both the Sacramento Winter Chinook and Sacramento River Fall Chinook forecasts for 2023 compared to earlier years would, would be valuable in assessing the impact of atypical hatchery practices on the forecasts and resultant allowable exploitation rates for those stocks. And in fact, so you know, this report was written before the 2022 preseason report one came out, but in fact, um, that report already was able to separate out the hatchery versus natural contributions to the winter Chinook forecast, but we don't yet have that kind of information for the fall Chinook forecast. And then in, in, in addition, refined ecosystem indicators specific to Central Valley Spring Chinook and which should include this yearling life history that we very rarely see in fall run, but maybe more important for spring run and especially in drought years, uh, might better inform the incubation and ocean survival expected for brood year 2020 Central Valley Spring Chinook. And so provide a further refined sense of the likely cohort strength when paired with the information we already have on the parent spawner abundance and the downstream, mig downstream migration survival. Um, and there are a few references attached to the report, and I'd be happy to try to address any questions you have. Thanks. Yeah, thank, thank you, Will. Uh, questions for Will on the, his report? Okay, see no hands. Oh, um, Susan Bishop, Susan. Uh, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, Dr. Southaway, I just have a question as to whether, I think there was also mention in the report of the use, potential use of environmental indicators that could be helpful. Um, I was wondering if you could expand on that just a little bit, and also if you had an assessment maybe of what the what it would take to do the work that's being suggested uh, in terms of, is it a significant amount of work? Would it take a long time? What, what do you think the timeline would be? Yeah, so I think it sort of depends on um, different components of the work being suggested. And so like I mentioned, in terms of getting the hatchery versus natural contributions to the winter Chinook forecast, that's actually now been implemented. Um, we would still need to do it going back as far back in time as we can to get sort of context to compare different years against. But so the winter Chinook forecast composition, I think we can say that's that's pretty easy. That's essentially almost done. Um, getting the natural versus hatchery origin contributions to the Sacramento Fall Chinook forecast, uh, that I think you know would involve considerably more work um, and would likely require the um, contribution from CDFW and you know they may have answers to that question as well but I mean my understanding is the data required to sort of break down so the Sacramento Fall Chinook forecast is driven by the number of jacks returning the previous year and so if we knew the proportion of jacks the previous year that were of natural origin versus hatchery origin we could then break down what's the contribution of each origin type to the overall forecast. And so my understanding is that all the data that would be required to do that estimation of the composition, those data are gathered, they do exist, but then the challenge would be analyzing and reporting them on a quick enough timeframe to inform the forecasting. Um, 
And so I think you know, that's something that we'd have to discuss further exactly what the workload entailed in doing that and doing it on the required time frame would be. And then, yeah, there's also the idea. So um, we have an existing suite of indicators for Center Valley Fall Chinook. And um, the proposal is that that could be adapted to Center Valley Spring Chinook. You know, a lot of the timings of life history events are similar between those two stocks, but then obviously also some things like return timing differ. And then also the locations in which the fish do these various things differ. Um, so, you know, I'm not sure I can say exactly how much work and what the timeline that work would entail would be, but I think we have a very good starting point in what's already assembled for the Central Valley Fall Chinook indicators. Um, and I noticed there is also a supplemental report from the Habitat Committee where they may be able to speak to that a little bit more. Um, and, you know, I think certainly, you know, bodies like the Habitat Committee, um, the CCIA team, um, in addition to agency scientists might be able to contribute to the development of those kinds of indicators. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you very much. Okay, okay. Um, thank you, Susan. Uh, Marcy Rimko, Marcy? Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Vice Chair. Thank you um, for the discussion here. I um, wanna thank Susan for her prior question. I think I wanna just build on it a little bit uh, surrounding uh, the plan to work for 2022. Um, I guess I'm just wondering, do you have um, a specific ask of the council? Um, I'm just trying to um, ascertain what might be necessary to engage in this work and what reasonably can be done on this timeline, also acknowledging a number of other priority items. And also in your response, if you could also address the uh, the remark, I'm sure you saw it, it was uh, actually under uh, D3, but from Kramer Fish Sciences, uh, with some recommendations about spring run and cohort reconstruction, and if that's in your sphere of work uh, as well on, in the plans. So I'm just hoping to hear a little more about what, what we can do now and how we consider um, this item in the suite of other priorities that, that we'll be considering over the next year. Great. Uh, thanks for the question. Um, and yeah, so first I think, you know, in terms of what, you know, a potential request might be in the near term would be, so, you know, as so I understand that CDFW is already providing an estimate of jack escapement in time to inform the forecasts when we you know, have the March meeting. And so I think the request would be providing that number of jacks, but then broken down into the number of jacks that were of hatchery origin versus the number of jacks which were of natural origin. And you know, my understanding is that the data required to do that are analyzed as part of things like the constant fractional marking reports, but that they aren't, that those analyses aren't necessarily um, completed on the time frame we would need. Um, so you know, the question would be sort of can it be done on that time frame? But I guess the request would be just give the jack escapement from the previous year broken down by origin. Um, and then, yeah, I did see the um, comment from um, Dr. Cavallo. Um, and yeah, he brings up you know, the question of, could we be doing cohort reconstructions for Central Valley Spring Chinook? Um, and as he points out, um, there's a paper that I wrote with a few former members of the STT that says, you know, it should be possible to do a cohort reconstruction based on Fed the River Hatchery Spring Chinook code wire tags. Um, and I think, you know, it, it's fair to say it would be possible to do a cohort reconstruction. Um, and, you know, as, as the client points out, there are probably more ocean recoveries of code, well, there are more ocean recoveries of code wire tags from Feather River, Spring Chinook, than there are from Sacramento Winter Chinook that we already do cohort reconstructions from. Um, so I think it's possible. Um, there are some challenges though. Um, one challenge would be the quality of the escapement data that is also needed to do the cohort reconstructions. 
And my understanding is that in recent years, it probably should be more than adequate, but exactly which years would be suitable would need to be worked out. Um, there's also the question of how representative are Feather River Hatchery Spring Chinook of the Spring Chinook ESU in general. Um, I think it's sort of always fair to ask how representative is a hatchery stock for the sort of larger complex we're hoping it's representative of. Um, based on the sort of histories and practices of the different hatcheries, you know, I think you might make a case that the Livingston Stone Winter Chinook program is probably about the most representative kind of hatchery you could have and Feather River Spring Chinook program, at least historically, might not be as closely representative of the rest of the ESU. Um, and then one other challenge in doing a cohort reconstruction for Spring Chinook is to do a cohort reconstruction, you need to sort of assume a birthday, you know, sort of at what point do you count harvest against the fish you could have returned in one calendar year versus the next calendar year? Um, partly it's just a matter of, do we have the information to even know what's the best single date to choose for spring run, but then also what are the consequences of getting that date wrong or just, you know, how, how, how much of a violation of the assumption that all fish come back the same day will there be for different stocks? And so for winter run, the exact choice of the birthday is not very consequential because fisheries are closed right around the time they come back anyway. Um, conversely, for spring chinook, they're probably coming back sometime May, June, July-ish, and that's kind of often the peak of the fishery. So it becomes a lot more critical how you treat, you know, the potential that a fish you caught would have come back this year versus the next year. Um, but so I guess, I mean, Long story short, I think it's possible. I think, you know, there would be concerns associated with any cohort reconstruction. Um, but then the question, there also certainly would be questions, how fast could it be implemented? And then how much guidance does a cohort reconstruction alone give us? So we could potentially estimate an exploitation rate, but we wouldn't necessarily know what an appropriate exploitation rate is. Um, that said, you know, even just relatively speaking, we might be able to say, fisheries in this time and area have either a relatively high or a relatively low impact relative to fisheries in different times and areas. So I hope that answers your question. I can answer any follow-ups if it didn't. Okay, thank you, Will. Um, further questions for Will? Okay, not seeing any hands. All right, oh, Marcy. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. I, I had to stop and think a minute. <laughs> I appreciate the opportunity. Um, well, I I was hoping you might address these I, I newly identified needs for spring run kind of as a matter of priority. Um, I'm just trying to gauge, I mean, you, you just gave us a, <laughs> a big heaping dose of a lot of work and I'm just trying to think in my mind, um, what what is the first bite to take if we can take any bite at all? So maybe you can help me think about these and sort of some sort of priority order. Yeah, and you know, certainly this is just speaking for myself and not any kind of agency position, but I would think definitely for, from my perspective, first bite would be just getting the composition of the Sacramento Fall Chinook Jack escapement to sort of know how much we need to worry about whether that forecast is reflective of you know, conditions for natural origin, spring run especially. Um, and then beyond that, I think you know, there's, there's value in the cohort reconstruction for sure, um, but how valuable it is in the near term without knowing what proper or you know, sort of appropriate exploitation rates are um, might be a little bit harder to quantify in the near term. Um, I guess one other thing I didn't mention Historically, there was a brief um, code war tagging program on natural origin Butte Creek spring run, but that was discontinued, you know, I think almost two decades ago now, and that didn't really yield the kind of sample sizes we would need. Um, and so, and obviously that's not gonna help in the near term, you know, unless a new tagging program is ramped up and then we need time to recover those tags. So in the near term, if we want exploitation rates, it's really fed the river, spring Chinook, or nothing in terms of spring run. Thank okay. you. 
Thank you, Marcy. Anyone else? Okay. Thank you, Will. Okay, that uh, takes us to um, D1B and uh, Susan Bishop, I believe. Susan. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, thank you, Council Members. It's nice to see everybody again, I have to say. Um, I will be speaking to Agenda Item D1B, Supplemental NIMS Report 1, uh, NIMS Regulatory Activities of Interest to the Council. I'll give you a quick overview and then I'm happy to uh, answer any questions that anyone might have of, of the five topics that I'll be covering. Um, to begin with, um, NIMS is conducting, uh, Council is currently managing uh, four salmon stocks under rebuilding plans. As you know, Klamath River, Falshina, Queets River, Coho, the Strait of Juan de Fuca, Coho, and Snohomish River, Coho. Um, uh, Sacramento River, Falshina had been declared overfished, but last year was declared rebuilt. Um, and so it is no longer among the rebuilding plans. Um, each year, or uh, on a periodic basis, the Magnuson-Stevens Act requires that NIMS review the plans um, uh, for making adequate progress uh, toward rebuilding, and that timeline is generally at least, at, at least every two years. Uh, NIMS has begun to review these stocks for adequate progress towards rebuilding, and we expect to complete this review prior to April of 2020 and to report back to the Council on our findings uh, essentially at next month's meeting. Should NIMS can determine that any of the rebuilding plans are making inadequate progress, so that's really the, the determination, the big determination that would be made is, any, is anything lacking making progress. We will send a letter to the council um, notifying you um, and that essentially starts a two year clock um, in which there, will, there would be an assessment of whether additional conservation measures would be needed and, and potentially um, a, a new rebuilding plan. At that point, we would we would work with the council and the affected co-managers to determine what the appropriate next steps are. So I'll just pause there for a minute in case anyone has questions on that topic. Questions for Susan? Oh, um, Marcy. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Thank you, Susan. And I really do appreciate you bringing this to the council's attention. Um, since you make mention of presenting the findings at the April meeting, um, I, I'm guessing you have some idea of what those findings might be. Um, and I am um, thinking about Klamath River Fall Chinook, and I know it sounds like we have a two-year uh, time period to work through the next steps, um, but I guess my, my question is, are you anticipating um, the reformation of a work team such as the the STT to address, like when they uh, were tasked with developing the rebuilding plan, um, will this fall to the STT or are you expecting a, a larger group effort to be needed? So I think at this time, uh, it, I would be speculating. I mean, it's really going to depend on what our findings are um, and also, you know, what would have caused us concern if we should find that there's a lack of, of progress. Um, I can't speak to findings at this point um, because we're still in the process of doing our, our work. Um, um, we would certainly reach out to the managers that were involved um, to decide what those uh, next steps would be. Oop, okay. Thank you. Yeah, I guess we'll wait to hear more. Appreciate it. Thank you, Marcy. Uh, Susan? Um, if there's no further questions there, our next uh, topic is uh, Hood Canal Coho. And not to steal any thunder, thunder from the salmon technical team, um, we just wanted to talk a little bit here about process. Uh, in 2021, NIMS determined that the Hood Canal Coho salmon stock was approaching an overfished condition. Um, preliminary information in the post-ocean review, which I think um, uh, Dr. O'Farrell will be reviewing uh, subsequently, suggests that the stock now uh, likely meets the Pacific Coast salmon FMP criteria for overfish status um, when NEMS completes its uh, stock assessments uh, over the summer. 
Um, once we complete our uh, stock assessment, taking into account the information that the council um, provides, um, uh, we will make an official determination on whether uh, Hood Canal Coho are in fact overfished. Uh, and we'll bring that back to the council. We anticipate um, it'll take us till September to make that determination. And uh, we would notify the council of our decision by letter. Um, in that event, should uh, we determine um, similarly to what the current inf information indicates that the stock in fact does meet the uh, uh, criteria for being overfished, uh, there are several Magnuson timelines that kick in. Um, so the, the, as, as you know from going through the recent salmon rebuilding plans, we have a two-year timeline to, for, uh, to complete the, the rebuilding plan and for NIMS to adopt that rebuilding plan. So essentially over the next couple of years, that would look like um, the council developing and transmitting a rebuilding plan uh, by December of 2023. So there's sort of this initial draft rebuilding plan that happens that's required over kind of a 15 month time frame. Um, and that would anticipate council final action to adopt the, the rebuilding plan at the November 2023 council uh, meeting. Then NIMS would target completion of the regulatory process by August or September of 2024. You know, again, we're anticipating that um, should we um, affirm the preliminary information we have in front of us, we would be engaging the co-managers, the affected co-managers set like we did before in the development of that plan. Any questions there? Nope. Good. Uh, the, my next topic is just an update on the progress on the uh, Southern Oregon, Northern California coho uh, control rule uh, FMP amendment. Um, if you recall, in January, the council held an emergency meeting and adopted a new harvest control rule that limits council area salmon fishery impacts on, um, on the threatened sunk uh, coho ESU. And the, and the council's motion would amend the salmon FMP to incorporate those new harvest control rules. Um, NIMS is, connect, is uh, conducting a new ESA consultation. So last December, we went ahead and reinitiated consultation um, on the effects of ocean fisheries under the FMP, which includes the new control rules. So essentially the effects of both implementing the FMP um, under those new control rules. And we expect to complete that new consultation prior to the promulgation of the 2022 salmon management measures. Um, the council adoption of a new control rule, the decision of NIMS, NIMS whether to reinitiate consultation and completion of a biological opinion are sort of the final three steps in the stay of litigation that we reached with the Hoopa Valley tribe. Um, for those of you that have asked me those questions. Um, and then with by about early fall 2022, uh, NIMS should make its determination on whether to approve, partially approve, or deny the amendment. That's sort of our task at that time. Um, so that's our sort of our timeline. We're working on that now. We'll have the biological opinion um, completed hopefully within the next couple of months, uh, and then with a final decision on the amendment by um, fall. Any questions on that timeline or process? Uh, Marcy Remco. Marcy. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, thank you, Suzanne. Um, I know this uh, is a topic of great concern, uh, particularly in the California SAS uh, arena. Um, I guess I'm really just hoping that um, you might be able to aid us with some clarity um, on the process. I, I know we're still waiting for uh things to finalize on the biop and um the meanwhile the um you know there there's some um, uh, other elements uh in play um we know that the Hoopa Valley Tribe uh, has the, um, there's the Tribal Resource Management Plan and the EA comment period uh, that is open now uh, through, I think, March, sometime in March. Um, but we are, um, we're kind of, uh, you know, an unknown territory here on process. And I know these are questions that our stakeholders are asking us. 
and I believe they're asking you as well. Um, you know, I, I think we're just very interested in knowing um, how to address the situation in council um, management and planning, um, recognizing that, um, you know, we do have, we are working now under um, a new uh, total harvest control rule of 16% uh, for the, the, the Trinity stock. So um, any clarity you can, can provide us, I think would be useful. And, and I realize it's it's all new for all of us, um, but this has just been an area where um, a lot of questions are coming about, well, what happens next? And does the ocean just get what's left over and, and how is this going to work? So um, maybe you can, if you wouldn't mind giving us kind of a brief description of the next steps between now and, um, the, the time the biop is finalized, uh, that would be great. Thank you, Ms. Iremko, for the question. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if you're speaking to clarification on the, uh, the, the uh, tribal resource uh, management plan that NIMS is currently considering. Um, or on the uh, Sonk Coho control rules, but I think you know the two of them. I think have melded pretty well. Um, I no, no secret that tomorrow NIMS will be providing its guidance letter, and the guidance for uh, Sonk Coho at that point will be to manage for uh, manage the fisheries to stay within the control rules, which are total exploitation rates. So those would take into account both the freshwater fisheries and the ocean fisheries. The motion that was adopted in January indicated that the co-managers would be providing to the STT the freshwater inputs for those um, fisheries. Uh, and in addition, the um, exploitation rates or the harvest impacts um, that we, in, uh, uh, um, the, the harvest impacts for the in-river fisheries were part of the risk assessment work that the work group did in coming to a, a decision with regard to the control rules on Sunk Coho. So the same information that will be used to inform sort of the uh, freshwater inputs for this year's um, fisheries were the same or similar um, to those that were used in the risk assessments. And so some of this, of course, is the responsibility of the co-managers to decide um, on the freshwater fisheries. Um, but I think we worked very hard in the work that we did with regard to the control rules to integrate the two and to use as much of the same information as we could. Good. Marcy? Uh, we'll just see. Maybe um, maybe we'll take this back up in the discussion of the guidance letter tomorrow. Um, I, okay. Very yeah, good. We're getting a lot of questions on process, so. We'll bring them tomorrow. Thank you. Okay. Susan? Um, the next, um, I've got two more issues to cover. Um, the next one has to do basically with sort of following up on the discussion we had earlier on Central Valley Spring Run Chinook's uh, salmon ESU and the status there. We're very concerned about all of the indicators with regard to the strength of that uh, ESU next year. and that in fact the some of the as uh, will i think explained in some detail um, that our assumptions that the measures in place for the um, sacramento winter run chinook um, may not be as protective as would typically be the case in most years um, given the additional actions that were taken for the 2020 brood years for the winter run and the fall chinook um, stocks so we're very concerned about what we're seeing there. Um, we do believe that it probably will need some additional caution next year. Um, and we think that it's very prudent to see what we could do proactively to, to do some of the analysis that the science center was suggesting might be helpful. I think it's entirely um, uh, reasonable as Ms. Yurimko suggested that we prioritize that work and everything else that we can do, but also to make a um, concerted effort to do as much as we can given uh, what we might be facing next year um, as the council. 
um, any help that we can get, you know, any anything that we can use of work that's already been being done, for example, by the Habitat Committee and its use of environmental indicators. Um, Will indicated that we had made some progress on some of the other issues that were originally raised in the uh, NIMS report. Um, we would be very supportive of getting that work done and um, bringing some resources to the table to help with that. Questions on that portion? I can read. Um, I do have a, just a real quick question there. If we were to ask for help from the Habitat Committee, what would be the process by which that would be done? Would that need to be uh, the the council asking for that to happen, or um, I'm just I'm a bit unclear. Uh, yeah, thank you, Mr. Vice Chairman. Um, yeah, in general, uh, Ms. Bishop, if if uh, we were to want some help from the Habitat Committee, the council would direct the committee to do that work. Thank you. Uh, the last agenda or the last item on my list uh, is an update on the um, listing petition for Upper Klamath Trinity River Spring Chinook um, um, that has been in the works for about four years now. Um, so um, that uh, the question about the uh, status determination, uh, listing determination is still ongoing. Um, so we have yet to make a final decision um, on that. So there's basically no change in the status of that work since um, I believe I reported in November. And that concludes the um, my NIMS report for today. Okay, thank you, Susan. Uh, questions for Susan um, on her report? Okay, I, th I think you're good to go. All right, thank you. Um, next up will be um, Corey Green and the Habitat Committee. Corey. Can you hear me? We do. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair and members of the council. I'm reporting on agenda item D1C, Supplemental Habitat Committee Report 1. Habitat Committee Report on the National Marine Fisheries Service NIMS Report. The review of conditions for Central Valley CV Spring Chinook highlighted the utility of habitat indicators developed for Central Valley and Klamath Far Run stocks for informing data poor stocks like CV Spring Chinook. These indicators are now annually updated in the Ecosystem Status Report, which is agenda item H2A, uh, California Current Ecosystem Status Report. And as noted in the report, they suggest poor freshwater conditions and mixed marine conditions for the 2020 brood year. The indicators were previously developed by the HC under Pacific Fishery Management Council guidance for addressing non-fishing issues associated with rebuilding plans of the two fall run stocks. The Habitat Committee supports NIMPS's report opinion that further refinement of the indicators for spring run stocks are warranted because of the differences in life history. A refinement approach may be useful for developing habitat indicators for other stocks of emerging concern. Thank you and I'd welcome questions. Okay, thank you, Corey. Uh, questions for Corey on the Habitat Committee report? Okay, seeing none. Thank you, Corey. Um, that, that, that's uh, that's our report for our, um, our governmental bodies and uh, advisory bodies, and I don't see any uh, public comment, which should take us to council discussion. And so with that, uh, open the floor for, for that. We heard some requests from uh, Susan about uh, the habit, having the Habitat Committee do something, and so um, something to certainly consider. Um, okay. Chris? Mr. Vice Chair, so you're looking for support or not for asking the Habitat Committee to weigh in on this? Well, I think that would probably be. Yeah. Um, if they've got the capacity for it, I think it'd be helpful. And I think they, they indicated, I don't remember if they're offhand, if they're, if they're, um, uh, sorry, 
I should have looked before I opened my mouth. Uh, I was trying to recall whether their um, their uh, submittal to the briefing book indicated they had, you know, time and capacity for it. I know they had indicated support for the concept, but I don't recall if they addressed whether they had capacity. So if they do, I would support that. Okay, very good. For the comment? Okay. Well, with that, Robin? Marcy. Oh, oh, I apologize, Marcy. I've got to keep looking at the screen here, so my, my bad. So, Marcy. No, no problem. Uh, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. I just want to acknowledge um, the heavy content uh, in the NIMS reports on uh, California's thoughts and just wanted to highlight um, the... I guess the change in climate in California and the heightened um, need for um, more work and acknowledging that the um, pervasive drought conditions um, are certainly um, <laughs> forcing all of us um, to um, take a closer look at what needs to be done and by when. Um, so I appreciate this discussion, um, appreciate the um, acknowledgement of uh, needs to prioritize um, and what is, what are the most important things um, that we might be able to um, contribute to or direct our our resource sources toward. Um, you know, unfortunately, it appears that the drought conditions are persistent. Um, new forecasts out earlier this week uh, again suggest. Um, more doom and gloom on the horizon for the Central Valley, uh, as well as the Klamath Basin. Um, nothing is looking good in terms of uh, water um, and temperature. So, um, you know, these are certainly huge priorities for our department, um, and we're continuing to focus um, our activities at, at trying to um, build our resilience. Um, so anyway, just appreciate this discussion and um, NIFS's willingness to um, contribute folks to looking toward this, um, towards these issues and trying to meet the highest priority needs. And um, we'll continue um, our discussions offline as well as with our, um, our inland counterparts in the department um, and see what we can do to, to um, to contribute to some of these tasks. Um, but of course, as, as we've mentioned uh, repeatedly in the last um, couple council meetings, we are um, definitely faced with a shortage of personnel. Um, and we're also seeing a number of personnel in our agency um, being redirected to um, very high priority uh, needs associated with drought, um, primarily uh, working on tasks like fish fish rescues, fish relocations, um, you know, immediate, immediate mitigation needs. So um, that's been our top priority and will continue to be. Um, but anyway, just wanted to um, note that um, we'll be working hard um, through spring and summer and just appreciate the acknowledgement from uh, NIMS, both the regional staff and the Science Center staff on these important issues. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Marcy. Oh, Susan. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Sorry, I'm still getting used to actually raising a real hand. <laughs> um, I, I would just ask, would the council be willing to task the Habitat Committee with examining um, kind of the discussion that we talked about today with regard to the use of indicators and to be able to report back as to what that, you know, could the issue of capacity was that Chris raised um, to, to help us decide where, if this is something that we might want to take up or uh, to what degree we might want to do that. Uh, thoughts here from the floor on that? Anybody against that? I, I think you're. I think you're probably good on that, as far as. Uh, thank you, Mr. Vice Chairman. So, uh, Ms. Bishop, just to clarify uh, your question, so are are you asking uh, for us to ask the Habitat Committee if they have the capacity to do this work? 
and then to take that up later, like maybe under workload planning. I just want to make sure I'm clear what your question is. Thank you, Mr. Burden. Um, yes, that is, that's what I am asking. I mean, it sounded like from the dis council discussion that there was a little bit more information that the council needed, um, um, but that if the um, Habitat Committee does have the capacity to do this, I sense that there was support for them to take it up. Okay. Well, then we'll, we'll do that at a uh, day last. So, okay. Anyone else? Robin? How are we doing here? Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. So, yeah, under this agenda item, uh, we heard a lot of information regarding salmon and a lot of things that are on the horizon, uh, none of them small things. Um, but very good information to have and very good information to have as we work through this salmon year. Um, we've also talked about the Habitat Committee letting us know if they um, are going to have uh, within their workload enough room on their plate for um, looking into this Central Valley Spring Chinook issue and um, we'll hear back uh, from workload planning. Uh, the only caveat that I might add, and it doesn't need to be answered right now, I don't think, is I think the Habitat Committee has adjourned. I think they only do one day, but um, there's probably a work around there, but we can take that offline and pick it up later during the week. Just something that crossed my mind. So, But with that and with agenda item D1, I think you've uh, done your work under this agenda item, and um, thank you, everyone, for the information brought forward. Okay, thank you, Robin. Um, well, with that, we'll just go straight into D2. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. This is agenda item D2. Uh, this is the review of the 2021 fisheries and a summary of the 2022 stock forecast. So each year, the council looks at the stock assessment and fisheries evaluation document, which is the review document, and the stock abundance projections, which are found in preseason report one. Stock status for non-ESA listed and non-hatchery stocks are evaluated in the SAFE document relative to stock determination criteria, or SDC, for overfishing, overfished, not overfished, rebuilding, and rebuilt. These stocks are initially evaluated relative to the SDC and in the preseason report one for being at risk of approaching an overfish condition based on the current forecasts and last year's preseason fishery structure. The evaluation is updated in preseason report three once the upcoming salmon seasons are determined. So three stocks are required to have annual catch limits or ACLs specified. Sacramento River Fall Chinook, which is an indicator stock for the Central Valley Fall Chinook Complex. The Klamath River Fall Chinook, which is an indicator stock for the Southern Oregon, Northern California Chinook Complex, and Willapa Bay Natural Coho. These ACLs are equivalent to the acceptable biological catch and are specified based on formulas described in the Salmon Fishery Management Plan, which is provided as attachment one and the abundance forecast provided in preseason report one. Preseason report one also contains an analysis of the 2021 regulations on the projected 2022 abundances for coho and some Chinook stocks. This analysis is intended to provide perspective on how fisheries might need to be modified in 2022 to accommodate for the new abundance forecasts. The STT will review the results of this SAFE document in 2021, the stock abundance projections and ACLs for 2022 and stock status determinations. And the Scientific and Statistical Committee will review the forecast for stocks that are required to have ACLs specified and determine if the forecasts represent the best scientific information available for use in modeling and 2022 fisheries specifying ABCs and setting ACLs. So your work under this agenda item is to adopt the 2022 stock abundance forecasts, ACLs and AC, ABCs and ACLs, 
and then take action relative to any stock status determinations as necessary. Um, for your reference materials, you have both the review document and the pre-1 document available electronically. Uh, we have a STT report and a SSC report. And I think that is it from your, uh, from your management groups. So that concludes my summary. Very good. Thank you, uh, Robin. Uh, questions for Robin on her overview? Okay. Well, I believe we'll turn to uh, Michael Farrell and the SCT report. Mike? Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair, Council Members. Uh, a little rusty at this, um, but uh, it's good to be back in person. Um, I'm going to be providing a very um, brief overview of the <clears throat> review document and preseason report one. Um, I also note that uh, we submitted a supplemental STT report number one, which are excerpts from the review of ocean salmon fisheries and uh, preseason report one with key tables that. <clears throat> you may want to refer to during the, this portion of uh, my report. Okay, beginning with um, the review, um, chapter one is uh, focused on fisheries and catch aspects. Uh, and we lead off before getting into um, um, the catch, uh, what, we, what it was observed in 2021, uh, we look into what COVID-19 effects had on 2021 fisheries and monitoring in the Coastside Ocean Fisheries Summary. Um, very briefly, um, in Washington State, um, the ports of Nia Bay and La Push were uh, largely closed to access, entirely in some cases. Um, but I understand La Push was closed to access until July 12th for the troll fishery and open thereafter. Um, other ports uh, were open in along the Washington coast. There was some disruption of sampling, uh, very little as my, in my understanding, there were no onboard observation trips, um, but there was some um, there was uh, some voluntary reporting to cover for that. Um, in Oregon and California, there were no significant impacts to sampling and management in 2021. Um, with regard to catch and effort, in Washington, catch and effort were up relative to 2020 um, for sport and troll fisheries. The same was true for um, for uh, Oregon and uh, California as well. Uh, Treaty troll fishery catch and effort was up um, additionally. Uh, Chinook quota quotas were generally not met. Uh, and coho quota attainment was uh, also generally not met, but with some exceptions And table 1-6 um, details um, quota perf fishery performance. Chapter two of the review uh, describes Chinook escapement and stock status. Table 2-6, which is in your packet, uh, summarizes statement and status. Um, as has been mentioned in the previous um, agenda item, Klamath River Fall Chinook uh, remains overfished. Um, however, overfishing did not occur for any of the stocks, any of the Chinook stocks based on our most recent estimates. Chapter three focuses on coho escapement and stock status. Tables 3-7 in your packet summarized escapement and stock status. Um, see that um, Queets and uh, Strait of Juan de Fuca coho remain overfished, and Snohomish, Snohomish natural coho remain overfished, not over, I'm sorry, remain not overfished, rebuilding. As also was mentioned earlier, Hood Canal natural coho now meet criteria for overfished status. The three year geometric mean of escapement was 9,990 fish, and the MSST, the minimum stock size threshold, is 10,750. For the coho stocks, there has been no overfishing in recent years. Chapter four is focused on the socioeconomics. Appendix A are tables of catch and effort. Appendix B include tables of escapement. Appendix C is a compendium of regulations. 
And finally, Appendix D contains economic data. And that concludes my brief summary of the review. Um, I could go on to pre one or um, pause here if there are any questions on the review, whatever the council would like. Yeah, if there's any questions here for Mike. Um, oh, uh, Danny? Yes, thanks, Mr. Vice Chair, and thanks, Dr. O'Farrell. Um, you spoke to some COVID related, that there were minimal COVID related impacts in 2021. I am curious, were there any from 2020 that might have residual effects on the inputs, the escapement you do, harvest rate and exploitation rate calculations and forecasts that all go into the FRAM model? And did um, you come across areas where there may have been data deficiencies or data had to be imputed? Uh, Mr. Vice Chair, uh, Ms. Evanson, we um, we will be talking about that. Uh, we do talk about that a bit more in preseason report one, the uh, sampling lapses in 2020 did have effects on data that we're using for forecasting and um, modeling ocean fisheries in 2021. And I do, uh, I will touch on that briefly in uh, the next section of my presentation here. Thank you, Dr. O'Farrell. Okay. Okay, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, moving on oh, to precinct. Oh, I'm sorry, I see Phil's hand. Phil? Okay. Thanks, Mr. Vice Chair, and I don't have a question. I know we a lot of times um, kind of gloss over the review document report, but uh, there's a, a lot of work that goes into compiling all the data that goes into that document, and I find it to be one of the most useful <laughs> documents that there is around for going back and taking a look at the various uh, pieces of data that are in there. And I know it's a big job by the STT and the states to, and the tribes to provide the information. Just want to acknowledge that and acknowledge how valuable I think it is. Thank you, Phil. Okay, Michael. Okay, thank you for that. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. <clears throat> Preseason report one. Um, here again, we lead off with this time technical challenges uh, related to COVID-19. Um, uh, in 2020, there was lapse of, lapses in regular sampling um, in California in May and June. Uh, catch and effort estimates for the recreational fishery were not made using the state standard methods and um, data. And so many rec harvest estimates were based on preseason predictions scaled by pre to post ratios. Um, from July and other months that were uh, uh, where sampling occurred as normal. Um, June recreational harvest was partly sampled uh, only for the CPVS, CPFVs um, with, and not the skiffs. And so ratios of total recreational harvest to charter boat harvest was applied for each management area using the last 10 years of data. There were no code wire tag recoveries in May and in some areas for June. Um, code of water tag recoveries from June and July were used to impute code of water tag recoveries, recoveries for sample times and areas. And code of water ta tag compositions were from unsampled periods were imputed using surrogates from open periods. And this per plant pertains to California fisheries. California stocks, I should say. Moving on to chapter one, um, a summary of Chinook forecasts. Um, table 1-1 is in your um, packet here um, and has uh, more detailed descriptions of these forecasts. Um, just jumping to the results, Sacramento Fall Chinook is up uh, in abundance relative to 2021, the forecast that is. Um, Klamath, Klamath River Fall Chinook is up slightly as well, and Sacramento River Winter Chinook is down a bit, although the forecast from 2021 was a very large one for that stock. Uh, Columbia River stock abundances generally were similar or greater to last year. Um, there are some exceptions to that, however. Uh, Washington coastal stocks were mixed, as well as Puget Sound stocks with uh, mixed uh, increases and decreases from relative to last year. Table 1-2 summarizes coho forecasts. Uh, we have a relatively large OPIH forecast. It's lower than last year, but nonetheless still quite large. Um, 
Lower Columbia Natural and OCN uh, coho forecasts are up. And Washington coastal natural forecasts are higher than last year as well. Puget Sound forecasts are mixed and total Puget Sound forecast is slightly up for both natural and hatchery um, fish. Chapter two has the Chinook assessment um, and provides a description of the forecast and the computation of um, ACLs, ABCs, and OFLs for Sacramento River Falls Chinook and Klamath River Falls Chinook and some assessment of forecast performance. Chapter three is the coho assessment. Um, again, a, dis a description of forecasts, computation of ABCs, ACLs, and OFL for Willapa Bay Natural Coho, and again, some assessment of forecast performance. Chapter four is uh, uh, focused on pink salmon. It being an, odd, uh, or an even numbered year, there is uh, no forecast for pink salmon this year. Chapter five, um, isn't it uh, presents an analysis of the no action alternative, which would be the 2021 fisheries and the 2022 um, uh, abundance forecasts. And um, under the no action alternative, Sacramento River Fall Chinook and Sacramento River Winter Chinook are projected to meet their ob objectives. Klamath River Fall Chinook does not meet its uh, spawner or uh, exploitation rate objective. And California Coastal Chinook, uh, which con the consultation relies on the age four ocean harvest rate for Klamath River Fall Chinook, a maximum harvest rate, age four harvest rate of 16%. Um, it does not currently, the no action alternative does not meet that objective. Um, Columbia River Chinook project is projected to meet objectives. And uh, um, Strait of Juan de Fuca, Hood Canal, and Snohomish Natural Coho would not meet spawner objectives under the new uh, the, the no action alternative. Two other two tables that may be of interest to the council as well. Uh, table five four includes stock status uh, and evaluation for the of the no action alternative, and table five five is a table of the ABC ACL OFL um, information. I'll just point out there that. Escapement has exceeded the postseason ACLs and ABCs for all three stocks that require them. And then I'll also briefly mention um, something that isn't typically in preseason report one, um, but uh, needed to be explained a little bit this year. Um, we, uh, the STT has made some changes to the Klamath uh, Ocean Harvest Model and Sacramento Harvest Model. They have, we haven't made changes to the models themselves, but rather the data ranges used to um, forecast key input parameters for those harvest models. Um, as some may remember, this uh, was undertaken last year. Um, essentially, um, we use past data to inform future data for contact rates and harvest rates per unit of effort. Um, in some cases, those the data ranges used to estimate those parameters was very long, going back to the 1980s. Um, last year, we had noticed that um, we had been under predicting um, harvest rates and exploitation rates for these two stocks um, somewhat substantially. I thought that, that, that using constraint, constraining the estimation to more recent data would solve this problem by um, being more responsive to the current fishery situation. So we made a change. We shortened the data series to 2013 forward for Klamath River Fall Chinook and 2014 forward for Sacramento River Fall Chinook. Um, this year, when we came back, uh, the um, age four harvest rate for Klamath River Fall Chinook and the Sacramento Fall Chinook uh, ocean harvest rate were again under predicted and by a substantial amount. And so we um, took a look at the data and um, made the decision to further shorten um, the uh, data ranges used to forecast those key input parameters. Um, the cause of these, the uh, underperformance of these harvest models seems to be related to these encounter rates or contact rates per unit of effort and not in errors in the estimates of um, abundance or of um, fishing effort. 
And so we explain this in more detail and uh, provide a, a, a very brief analysis of um, what we might expect uh, given in these uh, shorter data ranges to predict um, um, the input parameters. And uh, the model runs that are representative of the no action alternative in preseason report one reflect these modifications to uh, those model inputs. So that concludes um, my overview of the of preseason report one and its appendix, and uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Okay, questions for Dr. O'Farrell in the STT report? I, th I think you're good. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Okay. What's that? Oh. Marcy has her hand up, I see. Marcy. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Apologies uh, with a little bit of a late late hand there. Um, thank you, uh, Dr. O'Farrell. Um, appreciate the report. Um, you've talked about um, the model updates and uh, the... 2022 circumstances, um, but I guess I'm wondering if you um, can characterize. Um, I, I think what I'm what I'm concerned about is in the updates to the model, um, the likely uh, outcome is shifting fishing time in California. Um, further to the south because of more costly uh, time and area combinations to the north. And I'm just wondering if um, you're comfortable that um, piling kind of more time, and particularly I'm talking about the age four constraint uh, for Klamath fall, um, that we expect will be, you know, needing some adjustments uh, to fishery seasons compared to last year. But my concern is is actually with, you know, what happens if that time is all shifted further south, um, particularly to San Francisco and Monterey, um, where right now we're we're fine on our winter run constraint. We'll be fixing fishing at the um, the maximum allowed 20% uh, impact rate. But I'm just wondering if you see any potential concerns um, with how seasons might be designed in the south. Um, I guess just in response to an effort shift that might that is expected to occur. Yeah. Mr. Vice Chair, Ms. Remco, um, I will say that this um, in, uh, this modification to the model inputs resulted in more expensive fishing along the coast all over, um, not only in Northern California, but in Oregon, and um, as well as in the San Francisco and even management and Monterey management areas. I think one of the major issues for you know, the council this year is another low forecast of Klamath River Fall Chinook and uh, and, and also a, a model that uh, per day fishing open and most times in areas is going to take more Klamath River Fall Chinook than the model that was used last year. And that we are going to have to um, reduce some fishing opportunity in the areas where Klamath River Fall Chinook are caught the most frequently. And um, those are the areas that, you know, that, that emanate from the climate management zone, both north and south. And so the natural, um, you know, fishery reaction um, to these conditions, regardless of a change in the model, is to um, increase fisheries or uh, try to put as much time as you can in those areas for less costly for Klamath River Fall Chinook, so say Northern Oregon and Central California. And so um, that's, this is not a new thing. This has happened many times before. 
Um, and of course, when you do that, you do put pressure on other stocks. And in particular, you mentioned Win Sacramento Winter Chinook. And we do have um, an assessment for Sacramento River Winter Chinook. And so we uh, will be, you know, potentially increasing our impacts on that population, but not um, above what is allowed preseason. And so I can't guarantee what will happen in postseason um, after the shaping of fisheries this year, but I do know that we um, we will make sure that uh, fisheries are planned such that the conservation objectives and consultation standards are met. Um, and um, But I would expect, uh, as you mentioned, some redistribution of fish and effort um, given the changes in stocks and uh, abundances and, and uh, the changes in the model. Okay, Marcy, you good? Okay. I, oh, um, Phil. Uh, thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. Dr. Farrell, I wonder if you could comment on the performance of our of the OPI predictor. Understanding there's several different stocks that contribute to that, but. I know like last year we had a very strong forecast and while the return was good, it, it fell considerably short of what was forecasted. Again, this year we have a strong, pretty strong forecast and um, just wondering if there's any, um, was any discussion around how it performed last year, uh, any discussion about the reasons that it didn't perform as well as we thought, whether any adjustments have been made, uh, that kind of thing. Oh, thank you, Mr. Anderson, for the question. Um, I, unfortunately, I don't have good answers to your question. Um, I can uh, go back to the STT and uh, and talk to the more the regional experts on this and see if uh, if they have. Uh, that sort of information, but I, I don't have that myself right now. Chris? Uh, thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, just, I had a couple questions, but on the last point, um, we also do have a few folks that were at the Oregon Production Index technical team meeting this year where the forecast was done. So we could potentially consult with them a little bit and find out what discussion occurred. I think they did talk about it some, at least they usually do, but we, we could round that up too. Uh, but I have a couple questions for Dr. O'Farrell, and I don't want to get too far into the weeds, um, so I'll probably ask you to, to maybe have a chat later about a couple of more detailed questions, but a couple off the bat. Um, and I may have misinterpreted last year's um, process and uh, specifically to how it was reported in, in Pre-1. I recall there was a, a section in Pre-1 last year for a model update as well. And in that one, it had a number of sort of strata-specific time and area plots uh, that I think the team had looked at in trying to assess performance. So I think the question is, am I misinterpreting that last year we looked at it pretty strata specific in order to determine what the best quote best fit might be? Uh, and or if if that's correct, did we do it the same way this year or did we simply look, did the team simply look at um, the aggregate across the whole season change the data set and find that the aggregate across the whole season was a better fit than it would have been under the old, or was it more strata specific in the background? If that makes sense. Uh, yeah, thank you, Mr. Kern. Uh, it does make sense. Um, last year, we certainly had more um, graphical depictions of the changes um, in, in the appendix that we provided in pre one, um, you know, where we could see the, month and area specific changes that the shortening the data series made. Um, but nonetheless, the um, ch data changes that were made were made across the board um, in, uh, in uh, both troll fisheries and recreational fisheries and uh, uh, along up and down the coast. And so um, the same is true for um, this, this uh, modification again, um, and it was looked into there was less, uh, there were less figures, um, mostly just based on a lack of time to get things together uh, in more detail, but um, I'm happy to um, walk through uh, some additional information with you and 
any uh, and others here at the council as the week goes on. Thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. Thanks, thanks, Mike. Um, I appreciate that. Um, the, one of the reasons I ask, maybe not the only, is you know the last two years in Oregon, uh, troll fishery have been two of the worst landing years that we've ever had when we weren't just closed. And so it's, you know, I need to get my head around how impacts can go up in some areas uh, when catch is simultaneously going down, recognizing it's a rate and that, you know, the abundance is down too. So I can envision how it could occur, but I probably need a little walk through to get my head around why. Thank you. Okay. Anyone else? Questions for uh, Dr. O'Farrell? Mike, I think you're free now, I think. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Much appreciated. Okay. Um, next up is uh, Galen Johnson and uh, SSC report. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Good afternoon, Council. I'm going to be reading agenda item D2A. This is Galen Johnson, the chair of the SSC, and uh, Dr. Will Satterthwaite is also here to help with answering any questions you might have. Um, the Scientific and Statistical Committee discussed the review of 2021 ocean salmon fisheries and preseason report one for 2022. Mm -hmm. Dr. Michael O'Farrell of the Southwest Fisheries Science Center and the Salmon Technical Team Chair provided a brief summary of the reports and members of the STT were available to answer questions. The SSC appreciates the work of the STT in compiling these reports and providing an early look at key pieces of preseason report one in draft form, which was really helpful. The availability of of the preseason report one was not announced until Monday, March 7th, limiting review of the remainder of the report. Sampling of fisheries in 2021 was not affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. However, the disruption of tagging and marking of juveniles in 2020 will affect recoveries of coded wire tags from adults of that cohort and may affect planning and implementation of mark selective fisheries on that cohort. The council is tasked with specifying annual catch limits for Sacramento River Fall Chinook, an indicator stock for the Central Valley Fall Chinook Complex, Klamath River Fall Chinook, an indicator stock for the Southern Oregon Northern California Chinook Complex, and Willapa Bay Natural Coho. Preseason Report 1 presents ACLs for these three stocks in Table V4. The forecasts for SRFC and KRSC are derived from forecast models that have been reviewed and approved by the SSC in previous years. The Willapa Bay Co Natural Coho forecast methodology was reviewed and endorsed by the SSC in November of 2021. The SSC found the calculations of the acceptable biological catches and corresponding ACLs correct based on the forecast for all three stocks. The council adopted rebuilding plans in 2019 for five salmon stocks. Sacramento, Sacramento River Fall Chinook, Klamath River Fall Chinook, Queets River Coho, Juan de Fuca Coho, and Snohomish River Coho. In 2021, Sacramento River Fall Chinook met the criteria for rebuilt status. The three year geometric mean spawning escapements for the other stocks in 2022. Um, are for Klamath River Fall Chinook. The three-year geometric mean natural area spawning abundance is 25,039, which is less than the minimum stock size threshold of 30,525. The stock meets the criteria for overfished status. For Queets River Coho, the three-year geometric mean adult spawning escapement is 2,654, which is less than the MSST of 4,350. The stock meets the criteria for overfished status. Juan de Fuca Coho, the three-year geometric mean adult spawning escapement is 6,002, which is less than the MSST of 7,000. The stock meets the criteria for overfished status. Um, and a bullet dropped out, sorry, so it makes it difficult for you all to read. I'm sorry about that. Snohomish River Coho, the three-year geometric mean adult spawning escapement is 46,418, which is more than the MSST of 31,000, but less than the SMSY of 50,000. The stock meets the criteria for not overfished rebuilding status. Hood Canal Coho meet the overfished criteria as the three-year geometric mean adult spawning escapement is 9,990, which is less than the MSST of 10,750. None of the Chinook or Coho stocks were determined to be subject to overfishing. However, the exploitation rates for 2021 were not available except 
for Sacramento River Fall Chinook and Klamath River Fall Chinook. A stock is approaching an overfished condition if the three-year ge geometric mean of the most recent two years and the 2022 forecast of spawning escapement given last year's fishing regulations is less than the MSST. The Klamath River Fall Chinook and Juan de Fuca Coho meet the criteria for being at risk of approaching an overfished condition. The results presented in preseason report one are point estimates and associated uncertainties are generally not reported. The SSC reiterates its strong recommendation that council salmon reports provide and incorporate appropriate measures of uncertainty as, it current, as is currently done for groundfish, coastal pelagic species, and highly migratory species. The SSC notes that there remains considerable uncertainty about which aspects of the preseason report one the SSC is specifically charged with reviewing and endorsing under the Pacific Coast Salmon Fisheries Fishery Management Plan and about the process of initiating potential changes to salmon reference points, for example, MSST and MFMT. Um, there's more details in the Salmon Subcommittee report attached to the Supplemental SSC report under C10 in June 2021. And that concludes our statements. Thank you, Galen. Um, questions for Galen on the SSC report? Okay, I'm not seeing any hands, so wonderful. Thank you, Gavin. And with that, um, I don't think there's any public comment at this point in time. We should, so I think that takes us to council action. And uh, with that, I'll open the floor for discussion. Motions. So, Thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. I had a question for uh, Susan. Um, relative to the determination of whether or not our forecast constitutes the best scientific information available, what's the, is there a procedure and or timing for that once, once all of these reports are provided in the review of the SSC, is there an addition, some additional steps taken within NIMS to meet the requirements of the determination of BSIA? Thank you for the question, Mr. Anderson. Um, we do not take a formal, we do not make a formal um, uh, um, determination that that's BSIA. Um, the information is outlined in all of the reports. Um, that the council produces and the review that occurs among the various technical committees. Um, the, uh, we will be producing a report to the council, a draft report in the council, I believe, for next month with regard to BSIA um, and the process that the council takes to ensure that its uh, information is the best available science. Um, you will see in that report that the process um, that we have got, just gone through here is outlined in that report um, as the uh, steps that are taken to ensure BSIA. Is that helpful? Okay, th thank you, Phil. Further discussion? Is time for a break, maybe? Kyle Addix, Kyle. Um, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. I do have a motion if there's no additional council discussion. Well, I think maybe um, seeing the dearth of uh, hands, that might be an exceptional idea. I move that the council adopt the 2022 stock abundance forecast, ABCs, ACLs, and OFLs as presented in agenda item D2, supplemental preseason report one. Okay, thank you, Kyle. Is a, the language of the screen accurate reflect your motion? It does. Very good. Looking for a second. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Second by Chair Grolnick. Thank you, Mark. Uh, Kyle, I'll speak to your motion, please. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, similar to Mr. Anderson's comments on the review document, the, the preseason one report is a, a huge amount of work by the STT. 
um, the second year in a row where they had to put together both of those documents without the benefit of getting together in one place and focusing for a week. So appreciate to appreciation to them as well as to all the other scientists from various agencies and tribes up and down the coast who, who worked on these forecasts. Um, as we heard from the SSC, they have reviewed the forecast methods for the three stocks um, where the council's required to take action on the ABCs and ACLs um, and confirmed that the, the numbers are correct in pre one based on the STT's work. The remaining forecasts are, the, I believe, the best available scientific information um, from the experts that put together those forecasts up and down the coast. So um, I think this is the best information we have for the coming days and weeks and setting alternatives for fishing and reaching a final package in April. Okay, thank you for that. Further discussion? Comments? Okay, um, not seeing any hands. Um, I'll call for the question. So uh, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Motion passes unanimously. Very good. Thank you, Kyle. And with, I think, uh, what's that? Right. Yeah. So we still have the uh, take action relative to stock status determinations as, as necessary. And I guess I open the floor as far as if there's anything that uh, would fit that. Look into my salmon people. Or maybe not. Oh, uh, Robin? I'm holding up a yellow paddle right now. Okay. And for those that are online, the, uh, yeah, the, the yellow paddle uh, indicates a uh, pause for just a, a second here. So we'll, uh, we're not going to break. We're just going to stand by here. For a few moments. Mm -hmm. Robin. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. I'm sorry for the confusion and delay. Uh, yeah, so under uh, number two, the take action relative to the stock status determination as necessary, as you've heard from both NIMS and the STT, we did find that the Hood Canal coho meet the criteria for being overfished. I don't know necessarily if there is action to uh, take, but um, certainly the acknowledgement of that and NIMS has provided us a a glimpse of the path forward on that with the transmittal letters and acknowledgement and all of that. I'm looking at Mike Werner to make sure I'm saying the right things and that the council is doing its uh, its its uh, job, if you will. Um, so is, I don't know if we need a motion, but just the acknowledgement of the overfish status of the Hood Canal Coho. Okay. I think you've summed it up nicely, I believe. So um, I would look to Mike. We're good? Okay. Wonderful. So with that, I'll turn to you for a summary of uh, D2. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Yeah, under D2, we've ad adopted the 2022 stock abundance forecast, the ABCs, the ACLs, the OFLs and um, acknowledged a change in the stock status determination for those Hood Canal coho. Um, it's a good kickoff for the 2022 salmon preseason process. And again, I appreciate the thanks to the tribes and state and staff that's been uh, working on those review documents in the preseason one report. So with that, you've finished your business under D2. Okay, well, thank you, Robin. And uh, thank you everyone for all the hard work. And with that, I think uh, we'll take a 10 minute break and uh, start off with the, uh, with E1 at uh, 3.12. So we'll see you we'll back here at 3.12. Thank you.
Okay, we're going to get started here shortly. I think. Okay, we're at, uh, starting off uh, E1, and I'll look to uh, Todd to um, kick us off here. Todd? Yes, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Good afternoon, Council. Uh, welcome to the first ground fish agenda item for this meeting, E1. Uh, today, under the NIMPS report, we will be hearing from the National Marine Fisheries Service, West Coast Region. Uh, they plan to bring some information regarding rule makings, notices published in the Federal Register, as well as potentially some staffing information. Additionally, the Northwest Fisheries Science Center is going to be able to give an update regarding uh, fiscal year 22, 2022 uh, surveys, and they'll be providing a, a PowerPoint for that particular um, discussion. Looking at your briefing materials, you have three items. The first is the West Coast Region NIPS Report 1. Uh, the second is the supplemental PowerPoint, or excuse me, supplemental presentation from the Science Center. And the third item is a supplemental GAP report. As always under this agenda item, your action is to discuss and give guidance as appropriate. Uh, with that brief over to you, Mr. Vice Chair, I'm happy to give uh, answer any questions you may have, or we can move directly into the reports. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Todd. Uh, questions for Todd on this overview? Okay, not seeing any. Very good. And with that, I'll turn to uh, to uh, Ryan. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Okay, I will try to be brief here. I have two updates for the NIMS report, one speaking to our supplemental report, and then I have a brief staffing update, and, and they're not very long, so if you're, it's okay with you, I'll just combine them and then happy to take questions on both. So regarding the rulemaking report, uh, you have that in your briefing book is the supplemental NIMS report. This is in the typical format that we submit. Um, I'm not gonna take this in the exact order it's listed, but I do wanna highlight a few things. Uh, I'll start with the most recent we published our electronic monitoring bottom trawl slash cleanup uh, proposed rule on March 1st. Uh, this proposed rule is open for public comments until the end of this month. We published the vessel movement and monitoring pink shrimp cleanup final rule on March 2nd. Uh, and this final rule will be effective April 1st. Also wanted to highlight that since the November meeting, we filed a notice of issuance of a final Marine Mammal Protection Act Section 101A5E permit and negligible impact determination, which was published on December 10th for the Sablefish Pot Gear Fishery and subsequently published a temporary season extension for pot gear vessels in the Sablefish Primary Fishery as well as in-season adjustments for pot vessels in the limited entry fixed gear and open access fisheries. Both of those published on December 10th. And that MMPA permit is effective for three years. We also published the Council's November in season recommendation on December 23rd uh, with a follow up correction a week later. Uh, and lastly, I wanted to note <clears throat> that we recently obtained some funding to work with Amanda Gladix from Oregon Sea Grant on the workshops the Council recommended to help inform the development of pot gear marking feasibility. Uh, feasibility study required by our humpback biological opinion terms and conditions. Uh, so she should be starting to reach out to industry participants now to help gather recommendations for how we will proceed with developing those workshops. <clears throat> and that concludes my report on rulemaking. A couple brief updates on staffing. Uh, as you already heard from Barry, we have made a selection for our catch there lead and are very excited to have Maggie Summer. Uh, in that position. Um, I know with this group, I don't need to um, tell you all 
um, how amazing Maggie is and uh, how much we're looking forward to her um, professionalism, expertise um, uh, in that position. We do, uh, it's not lost on me that that comes at a loss for the state of Oregon. I'm sure I'll be paying that debt back for some time to come. <laughs> Um, the, the least I could do is we'll have Maggie on board starting May 9th, uh, which will at least allow some transition time uh, and her to continue to serve in her current role uh, at this meeting and the April Council meeting. Uh, finally, well, we have got approval for a what we call a ZP2 term position, uh, a relatively entry level staff position in our groundfish branch uh, and this will fill the whiting treaty coordinator role as well as provide uh, other support for the groundfish branch um, and that uh, will fill the position then or at least some of the duties that were previously performed by stacy miller before she took her uh, current other job within the region uh, so that brings our groundfish branch or, or will shortly in a couple months back up to and, and actually exceeding what was kind of historical levels so so we're very excited about that uh, and hopeful that that will help with council workload and other issues as best of course we can and that concludes my report okay thank you ryan um questions for ryan on uh, on the nips report okay not seeing any hands. Thank you, Ryan. With that, it'll take us to the uh, Fishery Science Center uh, activities report and uh, Craig Russell, I believe. Craig? Yes, good afternoon. Can you hear me okay? We can. Excellent. Well, good afternoon, uh, Vice Chair, Council members, and the Council family. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. For the record, uh, I am the Director of the Fishery Resource Analysis and Monitoring Division at the Northwest Fishery Science Center. Today, I will be providing a short update on our groundfish related surveys for 2022. And first, I will provide some background information on each survey for those less familiar with our surveys. And then I'll provide some quick updates on each survey. Uh, I'm pleased to report that the Northwest Fishery Science Center plans to field our full suite of surveys for 2022. And these surveys include, next slide please. The first is the full four vessel 2022 groundfish bottom trawl survey. The annual bottom trawl survey is a cornerstone of the Northwest Center's mission to ensure healthy ecosystems with productive and sustainable fisheries as mandated by the Magnuson-Stevens Act. Our top priority is providing long-term time series data for the scientific management of West Coast ground fishes and their ecosystem. The survey collects fishery independent data on abundance, distribution, and biology of the 90 plus species that are included in the West Coast ground fish management plan and also coastwide environmental sampling uh, for monitoring change within the California current ecosystem. And this will be the 23rd year in that time series. This year's full four vessel survey is planned for the usual two passes with two chartered vessels each pass from the US Canada border to the US Mexico border. Next slide, please. Following mobilization in Newport, Oregon, which is slated to start May 16th, we plan to conduct the 2022 groundfish survey between May 22nd and October 28th. On pass one, two West Coast chartered fishing vessels, the last straw and Miss Julie plan to sample the entire West Coast border to border uh, during the first half of the survey, starting May 22nd uh, with demobilization scheduled uh, around July 25th and 26th. And on pass two, two West Coast charter fishing vessels, the Noah's Ark and Excalibur, plan to sample the entire West Coast border to border during the second half of the survey, which is starting August 28th, or 22nd, I'm sorry, uh, and continuing to October 28th. And each pass is expected to be divided into four legs for 11 to 12 days each leg, with a total of approximately 752 stations sampled over the duration of the survey for a total of 188 sea days. Next slide, please. The next survey is the 2022 Southern California Rockfish Hook and Line Survey, and we plan to conduct the annual survey in fall of 22, and this marks the 18th year in this time series, dating back to 2004. This survey is an ongoing partnership between the Northwest Center, Pacific States Marine Fisheries Commission, and the sport fishing industry. And this cooperative research effort charters three vessels from the sport, commercial sport fishing fleet to generate abundance, biological, genetic, and ecosystem information that's used to assess and manage groundfish species and shelf depths throughout Southern California. 
The hook and line survey complements the Northwest Center's bottom trawl survey by sampling hard bottom habitats and areas of structure that we cannot easily access using trawl nets. The planned dates for this year's surveys are September 18th through October 7th. And I'll also mention that during the GAP and GMT meeting yesterday, we discussed interest in expanding the hook and line survey further north. And while we are discussing options to improve survey coverage, uh, we don't currently have the resources to do so while maintaining the integrity of our existing time series. Next slide, please. And finally, the 2022 California Current Ecosystem Hake Ecology and Survey Methods Research Crews in support of the Hake and Whiting Treaty. After successfully completing the biennial integrated ecosystem and Pacific Hake acoustic trawl survey in 2021, the joint US and Canada team have an off survey year this year in 2022. And so the joint teams plan to use the off year at sea mission to address topics that are important to the biennial survey, to evaluate specific questions that relate to enhancing and expanding the survey, and also collect information that supports ecosystem modeling and management. So the Northwest Center is planning 30 days at sea aboard the NOAA ship Shimada, and Fisheries Oceans Canada is planning 21 days on the Canadian Coast Guard Cutter Franklin. The main research objectives this year are to complete an intervessel calibration, or an IVC, between the two vessels to ensure consistent acoustic data between the two. Both vessels will use recent advances in EK80 acoustic technology to better understand fish acoustic properties to help further expand insights on species identification, discrimination, and size estimates. And the vessel Franklin plans to use a number of sampling tools to investigate the Hake mesopelagic interactions in the deeper mesopelagic layers. And this research is hoped to help refine future Hake survey biomass estimates. And finally, the team aboard the Shimada also plans to investigate the Hake mix and work towards characterizing rockfish habitat with the goal of improving discrimination of hake and rockfish in our acoustic data. And they use a variety of tools, including an AUV and eDNA analysis, for example, uh, with the goal to develop the capability of adding a rockfish index of abundance to our survey and to help refine habitat classification from acoustic data. So overall, our teams continue to diligently research and plan uh, ways to ensure that we accomplish our surveys this year. This includes the usual strong safety uh, travel, contingency, staffing, and contract protocols and options um, for all surveys, and of course, steady progress on gear readiness. Um, we, of course, also work closely with our assessment team to identify data collection contingencies. And we believe we have the minimal staffing identified for all surveys. At this point, we are on track to execute the full suite of Northwest Center ground fish surveys planned for 22. That said, things can change. We can encounter weather, unexpected staff shortages or other conditions that could force us to evaluate uh, one or more surveys. So we'll continue to keep the council informed on our survey status throughout the year and uh, stand ready to provide additional updates and information and certainly welcome discussion on our surveys. And that concludes our update today. Thank you very much, Mr. Vice Chair. Thank you, Craig. Uh, questions for Craig on uh, the uh, Northwest Science Center's uh, report? Phil? Thanks, uh, Mr. Vice Chair, and thanks, Greg, for that presentation. Um, during our deliberations with Canada on the Hague Treaty, we we heard about um, a survey restructuring workshop, and I wondered if you could tell us a little bit about that. Yes, thank you very much. Mr. Anderson, uh, yes, yeah, so uh, the Northwest Center in cooperation with DFO and the Southwest Center are looking at how we can uh, gain greater value and efficiency in our West Coast pelagic surveys, particularly with the Hake and the CPS uh, surveys. And so we are uh, having a series of workshops uh, in the next several months and really it's a multi-year effort um, to try to look at how we can uh, better collect that data and, and perhaps additional data to help us better inform stock assessments in our ecosystem interactions uh, studies. Uh, so right now I can tell you that next week we have uh, an internal NOAA workshop to get all of our scientists together to uh, get on the same page in terms of what all of our requirements and uh, ideal uh, future information collection ideas might be. Uh, and then following in April, there will be a, a workshop uh, with limited participation from external perspectives, which should include some industry representation. And this is an opportunity to uh, get ideas on the table for uh, how we can 
think differently about our surveys, but also uh, ensure that we are clear on what uh, we must continue to collect uh, so we do not uh, impact the long-term time series. I hope that answers your question. I just wanted to confirm what I under what I think I understood you to say is that there there would you will be reaching out to industry and providing an opportunity for them to have some representation at this workshop. Is that correct? Yes, that's that's correct. Uh, and and we have done so. We've got a project manager I should have mentioned earlier, Asia uh, Sumolo from uh, formerly of the West Coast region is our project manager working on this and has already made some contacts there. Just one more, um, and would it be reasonable to ask that uh, you could kind of report back to us at the appropriate time in terms of the, any findings that come out of that that workshop and any any improvements or changes that are being contemplated? Uh, absolutely, I think that's a very fair request and we would be pleased to do so. Thank you. Okay, thanks Phil. Um, Chair Grolich, Mark? Uh, thank you, Vice Chair, and thank you uh, very much for the presentation. Um, uh, we have struggled in the last year or so with uh, certain stocks for which we don't have much data, uh, and I'm specifically referring to the quillback and the copper. And, and I'm curious, which of the surveys that you have planned in 2022 are designed to collect data on these species? Thank you, Chair Grelnick. Uh, I, I don't have the exact details. Uh, I'd have to get back to you, uh, but I can say that uh, we'll continue to use the bottom trawl survey uh, and the hook and line survey uh, the way we have in the past years to provide what information we could uh, for those stocks. But I'd be happy to get back to you with any more specifics if we were targeting uh, those stocks differently. Yeah, that would be great because I'm not aware that there is such data, So, which we very badly would like to have. Okay. Understood. Um, any further questions for Craig? Okay, thanks, Craig. Um, Bob. Oh, Bob, sorry. Um, excuse me, Craig. Um, Bob Dooley, Bob. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Craig, thank you for the great report here. I and all the work you guys do in general. It's uh, playing off Phil's questions at the same U.S. Canada Whiting uh, meetings. We heard about sail drones. We heard about vessels of opportunity, and I just wondered how that plays into this. You know, taking uh, acoustic data from other vessels that have the same equipment. And I think there's been some work on that. And I just Curious how it, I didn't see it in your report, and I was curious how it plays into your work. Great question. Thank you very much. Uh, so that particular project on collecting uh, data from other vessels is is partially on hold due to a staffing constraint on our side, but we, we recognize the industry has continued to collect that data, and we're grateful for that. Um, but similarly, as you mentioned, other other capabilities uh, are, are being considered to see where we can collect additional information, be it vessels of opportunity and other other capabilities. So um, those are all on the table in terms of you know looking at what what will help us uh, collect the information that we uh, collectively agree is critical to the stock assessments and understanding of uh, species and ecosystem interactions there. Uh, but I didn't mention any of those specifically because I think that. There's a, there's a whole suite of tools, and I didn't want to get into each each one necessarily, but those two that I mentioned as part of the Hake survey this year were part of uh, ongoing um, studies that we were trying to uh, investigate to better collect with our current model uh, new information or better information. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Bob. Um, Marcy Remco. Marcy? Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Um, I also noticed that you referenced the gap discussion and the interest in uh, discussing the hook and line survey in detail and that you were evaluating the potential to expand that survey. Um, I note that in the presentation, you have a little footnote on that slide 
referencing some new contracts with chartered sport fishing vessels in 2022. Um, maybe you can remind us, has this uh, hook and line survey been flat funded uh, since its inception? Um, and I guess I'm I'm just curious, um, longer term, you know, this interest in um, surveying habitats that are not um, not cannot be surveyed with trawl gear. Um, you know, we've seen some expansions of other survey types, but maybe you can just other or other surveys for other things. Maybe you can just speak in a little more detail about the hook and line survey and. Um, the funding and the new contracts and a little more detail about um, your internal discussions on expansion. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Anko. Uh, so uh, direct answer to your first question uh, about the funding. Yes, it has been flat funding and it comes out of our centers uh, provided funding for cooperative research. Um, and that funding primarily uh, is uh, used by the Pacific States Marine Fishery Commission to contract those charter vessels. Uh, and so that is what is uh, occurring this year. Uh, typically, I think those contracts have been multi-year contracts and we're happen to be at a, at a new year contract for that. Um, so uh, that answers that question. I'm trying to think you wanted me to speak a little bit more about our discussions internally. Uh, I, I'd be happy to share that certainly we are, we recognize and the desire for additional data collections uh, in, in new areas. Um, and as we have these discussions, you know, we're thinking about them through the lens of maintaining the existing time series with the hook and line survey, for example, which is our highest priority so that we, we continue to provide that critical uh, information for the stock assessments. And so, you know, if, if there is additional work uh, collections needed north, we'd have to look at um, what resources would be required to do that um, and how best to do that. Um, and so right now, I also recognize that uh, there has been discussion about wanting to go further inshore and shallower. Um, and uh, right now, we're, we're looking no further than our usual 35 meters, recognizing also that the states uh, are uh, involved in, in surveys in shallower waters, too. So that's, that's the sum of where we are. Um, we, we, we're trying to have those conversations on top of the still complicated planning environment for just executing surveys this year. Uh, in the pandemic, but um, continue to have those internally. Thank you. I appreciate the response. Okay, thank you, Marcy. Um, anyone else? Questions for Greg? Okay. I th okay, Greg, I think we're good. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, next up is uh, Louis Zim with the uh, GAP report. Louis. You're muted. You're still muted, Louis. Where'd you go? Louis, I think you're muted on your end. Okay, there we go, Mr. Chair. <laughs> My computer is cooperating. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair, and thank you, members of the council. My name is Louis Zim, and I will be presenting the supplemental GAP report on agenda item E1C. The Ground Fish Advisory Subpanel Report on the National Marine Fisheries Service Report. The Groundfish Advisory Subpanel reviewed the briefing book documents and received presentations from Ms. Keeley Kent, National Marine Fisheries Service, West Coast Region, and Mr. Craig Russell, Northwest Fisheries Science Center, under this agenda item, and offers the following comments. Ms. Kent reviewed rulemaking actions that occurred since November 2021, provided information about initial planning for a fixed gear gear marking workshop, and updated the gap about 
West Coast region staffing, including the Catch Shares Coordinator and Hake Agreement Coordinator positions. Mr. Russell provided helpful summaries of upcoming 2022 research surveys, including the West Coast Bottom Trawl Survey, the Southern California Hook and Line Survey, and Off-Year Hake Ecosystem and Methodology Survey. The GAP appreciates these regular updates from the WCR and the NWFSC. Hook and Line Survey. As part of his presentation, Mr. Russell noted current consideration being given to expanding the geographic scope of the hook and line survey. The GAP appreciates consideration of expanding the Southern California hook and line survey north of Point Conception due to lack of information of nearshore species such as copper and quillback rockfish. Furthermore, the GAP highlights that an expanded hook and line survey could provide critically needed information about species that inhabit nearshore and untrawlable habitats. Therefore, the GAP requests the council recommend to NIMPS that reviewing the scope of the hook and line survey be expanded to include its north-south geographic range, as well as expanding the survey into currently unsurveyed areas, such as nearshore and untrollable habitats. The GAP also suggests that it would be helpful to include fishery participants in these planning efforts because it would provide an important opportunity for affected stakeholders to provide input on what areas might be the most beneficial for survey expansion. And that's the end of my statement. Thank you, Louis. Uh, questions for Louis on the gap statement? Okay. Seeing no hands. Thank you, Louis. Thank you. You bet. And with that, I think we have one public comment, I believe. Um, uh, Tom Matouche. Are you there, Tom? There we go. Okay. All right. Uh, <clears throat> good afternoon, Chair, Vice Chair, PFMC, and DFW staff, and others. I'd just like to tell you, mention that I was a CCFRP research person on a charter boat for 15 to 16 years working through Moss Landing Marine Lab. I spent the last four or five years at Bodega Marine Lab through UC Davis. And with what Mr. Zim said, there's a tremendous data set available in the near shore if we can find a way to officially bring that into our data. We've been catching and releasing fish. We've been measuring size. If you have size, you've got approximate age. We've been sexing these fish. So <clears throat> I would implore both federal and state authorities to figure out how to use this vast set of data that's already available and waiting for you. Thank you. I'm available for any questions. Thank you, Tom. Uh, questions for Tom on his testimony? Okay. Thanks, Tom. Thank you. Okay, with that, that wraps up public comment, which takes us to uh, council action, discussion, guidance as appropriate. So uh, with that, I'll open the floor for hands. Uh, Maggie Summer, Maggie. Thank you, Vice Chair. Just uh, appreciate the report and the uh, discussion and consideration of expanding the hook and line survey. I think we all recognize the importance and potential value of that. Uh, states are attempting some surveys in, in near shore state waters, but we also have resource constraints. And so, uh, you know, looking for opportunities for partnership or again, expansion of the, the Southern California Bite Survey if and when resources were to become possible to support that. Thanks. Thank you, Maggie. 
Uh, anyone else? Uh, Chair Gronick, Mark. I thank you, Vice Chair, and I'll follow on with with Maggie's comment. Um, if if our task is to maximize the benefit of our nation's uh, living marine resources while conserving them at the same time, <clears throat> we need information, and we've not had the robust data set on some federally managed species that we would all like. Um, I realize this is uh, not something within sustainable fisheries ability to dictate. Uh, this is, uh, these are priorities that are set uh, by the Science Center. And I realize that there are um, resource constraints, budget constraints, but I just wanna emphasize that um, there are, uh, the, the existing surveys may be terrific for certain stocks that we manage, uh, but we don't have surveys that adequately capture um, other stocks that we manage, um, largely because they're not susceptible to being surveyed in a, in a troll net because of the structure where they reside. So I, I would encourage the National Marine Fishery Service to find the resources to expand the hook and line survey or do whatever whatever other valid scientific methods are available to try to capture um, uh, in a fishery independent fashion uh, data so that we can have robust and reliable uh, stock assessments uh, for our management purposes. Okay. Thank you, Chair Grolick. Um, Marcy Uramko. Marcy. Yes, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, just to add to that, you know, this, I don't think this survey, um, frankly, is all that expensive. I'm, I'm not positive about that. I don't know the details, of course. Um, but I know that we are using uh, contracts with charter vessels and um, Many of those charter vessels uh, are members of or participate in the council process in one form or another um, and have uh, been very uh, dedicated to this pursuit. Um, I guess I would, I would just expect that um, it may not be that considerable in terms of cost to look at expanding this survey uh, in terms of and in terms of the, the cost benefit that would be achieved with expansion, I think um, th those points have been um, made here uh, in great detail. Um, I'd also note that, you know, that the technology used here on the hook and line survey um, is not difficult. Um, it's not, not always very high tech. Um, and occasionally, uh, the priority with new survey is, is to focus on, um, methods that might have, um, greater technological advancements. Um, but I'd note that as far as I recall, you know, over the years with the hook and line survey, there've been efforts to, to pair the survey with, um, ROV technology, um, or other measures um, that go on concurrently on the vessel. Um, but I would just hope that, you know, um, even though, you know, the concept of a hook and line survey is low tech, um, that it wouldn't be viewed as less important. Um, because I think as, as many have indicated, there is no other way to survey many of these species uh, effectively. And we are suffering in so many cases with our groundfish stocks of having no, no survey whatsoever. Um, and we're looking, you know, only at, at catch data and fishery dependent data. So um, I guess I just can't emphasize enough what a priority this really is. And thinking about some of the other coastwide surveys we do, um, multinational surveys, um, you know, efforts that take, you know, 90 days of sea time. Um, again, I'm, you know, not 
not familiar enough with the NIMS budget, science centers budgets on surveys uh, to really point at specifics, but I would bet we could get an awful lot of new information um, without a huge additional expense. Thank you. Thank you, Marcy. Heather Hall. Heather. Thank you, Vice Chair. Um, I just want to add on to this and, and um, offer my support for the recommendations and discussion here and, and the need for um, looking at these hook and line surveys and, and where they're expanded into different areas. And uh, just want to follow up on what we heard from the gap, I think, including uh, fishery participants in, in those efforts um, would be really valuable and could also perhaps uh, find other efficiencies as we look uh, look ahead. So uh, just wanted to add that on there too. Thank you. Thank you, Heather. Okay. Any other hands? Not seeing any. Um, I guess I'd turn to, uh, to Todd and to see how we're doing here, Todd. Yes, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, thank you very much. Um, I believe the council has heard both from the West Coast Region and the Science Center. You've had some discussion and some question answers, uh, as well as you heard a report from the GAP. Um, based on all this, I believe that the council has completed this uh, agenda item and could move on as you see fit. Thank you. Very good. Thank you, Todd. And with that, I will be more than happy to hand the gavel back to Chair Grolnick and we're a little bit still behind, but we've gained some time back and uh, I'll let him finish today. Thank you, Vice Chair Pettinger. Excellent job on the those agenda items. We'll move right into uh, Pacific Halibut Management. And I'll turn to our staff officer who is moving into position uh, to uh, get us started on agenda item F1, so just bear with us for a moment here. All right, Robin, please get us going. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This is agenda item F1, the annual International Pacific Halibut Commission meeting report. The 2022 annual meeting of the IPHC Commission was held online January 24 through 28 in 2022. The meeting included reports on recent survey results and current stock status, consideration for the probabilities of risks and benefits involved with specific harvest choices, and discussions focused on harvest policy and methods for distributing coastwide yield to regulatory areas. The IPHC reached agreement for 2022 Pacific Halibut catch limits, which is provided in the IPHC report one, which include the area 2A total catch exploitable yield or TCEY and the resulting fishery catch exploitable yield, the FCEY described in attachment one. These values reflect the IPHC unanimous approval in 2019 to maintain fixed harvestable levels in area 2A for four years, absent a substantive conservation concern. Under this agenda item, Dr. David Wilson, the director of the IPHC, will provide an overview of the annual meeting, stock assessment, and plans for upcoming stock assessment surveys. In addition, the annual IPHC Area 2A enforcement report is provided as attachment two under this agenda item. Mr. Phil Anderson, the Pacific Fishery Management Council's representative to the IPHC, attended the annual meeting along with numerous other interested parties from Area 2A. Mr. Anderson has provided a brief summary of the discussions and results of the meeting for council consideration, which is F1B, IPHC Representative Report 1. 
so uh, the council action under this agenda item is just to consider the IPHC meetings, provide guidance as appropriate. And there are also uh, reference material here for you. We have attachments one and two that were uh, mentioned in the situation summary. We also have uh, IPHC report one, which is the media release that outlines the completion of the 98th session of the IPHC meeting and agenda item F1B. We have the IPHC representative report as mentioned um, from Mr. Phil Anderson. Um, I believe that uh, the IPHC also has a PowerPoint um, available for us that they'll go through as well. And with that, I will wrap up my summary. Uh, thank you, Robin. Are there any questions of Robin on the overview that she provided? All right, thank you, Robin. So we will move straight to the IPHC report. Uh, Dr. David Wilson, Dr. David Wilson, are you with us? Good afternoon. Uh, thank you, uh, Vice Chair. Uh, th this is Barbara Hutnichak. I'm a Fisheries Policy uh, Branch Manager, filling in for Dr. Wilson, uh, our Executive Director. Could you please just confirm whether you can hear me well? Uh, could you? Uh, may I suggest you get closer to the microphone? Uh, it's very difficult to hear you, and there is some background noise. How is it now? And that's definitely better. So welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, I believe we have a presentation that was sent uh, to Pacific Council Secretariat if that could be brought on the screen. Thanks. Sure, we'll get that spooled up. There it is. Great, thank you very much. So the goal of this presentation is to, to provide a, a summary of the outcomes of the 98th session of the IPHC annual meeting. And uh, I don't think I can change the slide. Can I have the next slide? Thank you. So the 90th session of the IPHC annual meeting was held from 24th to 28th of January. It was held electronically with nearly 200 participants joining us virtually. Uh, and as always, the session was uh, open to the public. The information about the meeting are available on the website that is linked here below, as well as in the report that has been adopted as of 18th of February. Next slide, please. One of the main decisions of the commission that, uh, is, are the mortality limits that were adopted for 2022. Uh, these uh, are amounting to 41.22 uh, for the entire convention area. And for the regulatory area 2A, this is 1.62 million uh, pounds. Next slide, please. This uh, amounts to increase for the IPHC convention area of about 6% in total, but because of the uh, interim agreement for the regulatory area 2A, uh, this implies no change in the TCUI or uh, total constant exploitation yield for the 2A uh, from 2021 to 2022. Next slide, please. Uh, here we have the detailed mortality limits uh, that were uh, adopt, uh, based on the adopted uh, TCUI. And these here are providing, this table here is providing additional details uh, uh, that is presenting the, the limits by sectors that are distributed according to existing contracting, part, contracting party domestic catch sharing arrangements. Next slide. And here we have the stock assessment summary. And this part of the presentation will be uh, uh, provided by Dr. Stewart, our stock assessment expert. Thank you, Dr. Hudson Zach. Could I just confirm that uh, you can hear me, please? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you very much. And good afternoon, council members. 
Uh, I'll provide you just a brief overview of the results of this year's stock assessment. Um, the news this year was um, somewhat positive. Survey and fishery indices were up slightly, and there is an indication of a strong 2012 year class moving into the stock. We are seeing a shift in the stock distribution back toward the center of the distribution in uh, biological region three. And the spawning biomass is estimated to be pretty flat in the last several years with um, the projections showing that the spawning biomass is likely to remain at or near uh, levels that we've seen in the last few years based on this 2012 year class moving into the stock. So now I'll give you a little bit more detail. If I could have the next slide, please. Thank you. So to put the fishery limits for 2022 in context, uh, this figure shows you in blue the limits that were set by the commission over the last uh, nine years. And the gray bars show you the actual mortality that's estimated for each of those years. And as you can see, the Pacific halibut stock is generally um, quite fully utilized on an annual basis. However, in both 2020 and 2021, we saw lower than projected mortality um, in both of those years, generally as a function of the challenges that have faced many fisheries in the last couple of years. But what this has meant is that the stock has gotten a bit of a break in, in terms of the actual mortality compared to what we had projected for each of those years. And I think we're seeing some of that um, come through in the stock trends that we've seen. Next slide, please. This figure shows you by biological region, the survey trends that we've observed over the last several decades. You'll note that uh, in the bottom center at the coastwide level, we did see a 13% increase in the weight of all sizes of fish captured on the IPHC's annual survey. This includes both Pacific halibut above and below the 32 inch minimum size limit. Uh, so this was a, a, an important um, observation to see the, these increases. And you'll also note that region three, which is the central Gulf of Alaska, showed the largest increase uh, with somewhat less um, positive trends uh, in the other regions. Next slide, please. On the left here, you see our survey results um, for just O32 or legal size Pacific halibut. And you'll note that that is a, was a 4% increase over 2020, slightly less um, increasing than we saw for all sizes of fish. And this is an indication that some of these fish that have moved into the stock in the last year or two um, remain below that minimum size limit, um, consistent with the age of this 2012 year class that's moving into the stock. In the right-hand panel, you also see the, the over for the same time period, the trend in the commercial fisheries across the coast. And you'll note that generally our survey and the commercial catch rates as reported in fishery logbooks have been showing a very similar trend over this time period with some strong declines through the 2000s and relative stability since somewhere around 2010. Next slide, please. Now, this gives you slightly more detail focused specifically on IPHC regulatory area 2A. And we note that although we see very close correspondence between our survey activity and fishery trends at the coastwide level, as we get down to finer spatial scales, we tend to see more divergence in these trends. And uh, this is particularly pronounced in regulatory area 2A. On the right here, you see the catch rates from the 2A fisheries, the tribal in blue and the non-tribal in green, noting that these fisheries occur in different times and places in most years, and both are quite compressed, um, representing only a very small window of the overall season during which the survey operates. Um, and, and Perhaps because of this difference in both time and space, we don't tend to see a close correspondence between the two fisheries operating in 2A, and they also tend to differ from what we see on the annual uh, fishery independent set line survey. On the left-hand panel shows you that set line survey result for IPHC regulatory area 2A. And the takeaway here is that when we look comprehensively over all of 2A, we've seen some stability in, in, with a relatively flat trend over the last five years. Next slide, please. As we have seen some increases in abundance in the core of the stock in region three, this is translated into the stock distribution shifting back more toward the core of the stock. As you see for, for the last two years of these um, 
graphics shown here, which each of which represents the percent of the stock distributed into each of those biological regions. Uh, we don't have specific targets for each region, but we do note um, the historical window that we've observed the stock distribution over and that after a 10 or 15 year decline in stock the percent of the stock distributed to the core areas in, in Alaska, we have seen that start to increase again with commensurate decreases, both in region two, including 2A, and in region four uh, to the north and west. Next slide, please. The last slide on biology shows you the trends in weight at age for an age range from eight to 16 years old, which has been the most important to the commercial fishery over the last 100 years. As many of you are aware, Pacific halibut surplus production varies considerably on an annual basis and across decades. And after recruitment, size at age has been one of the primary drivers in these trends. For the same number of fish being landed at the dock, um, we, we see a very large difference in yield depending on how large those fish are for their age. The um, size at age reached a peak in the late 1970s and declined fairly continuously after that through um, until around the mid 2000s. The good news is that we are starting to see a trend, particularly in the younger ages of increasing size at age, which could show in the, in the medium to long term, um, some improvement in yield for the same number of fish in the stock. However, these patterns tend to change very slowly. And so this will be a long-term um, effect if, if it does, if in fact there is a, a trend occurring. Next slide, please. This figure shows you the results of this year's stock assessment. The blue banding shows you the probability intervals from the for spawning biomass from this year's assessment in comparison to the last nine years of, of assessments that have been conducted, each of which ending in a red point on this um, graphic. And so you can see that as we saw in the survey and commercial fishery trends, the stock declined steeply between the late 90s and around 2010. We did have a modest increase through about 2016 uh, on, the, on the strength of the 2005 year class, which was supporting the fisheries through that time period. And then subsequently, we've seen a slow decline in the spawning biomass. Next slide, please. That decline in spawning biomass has been driven by a fairly large gap in recruitment. Here you can see labeled the 99 and 2005 year classes, which were very important to the fishery prior to this recent time period. And then from 2006 to 2011, a period of low recruitments, the lowest we've seen in several decades uh, back to back, which has led to this decline in spawning biomass. Uh, after that, subsequent to that period, you see the strength of the 2012 year class here being shown in terms of relative recruitment across the four different stock assessment models that we use, um, indicating that although 2012 is, is considerably larger than the preceding six years, um, it's still not a giant year class. And that's why we're not seeing um, the projections showing a, a rapid increase, but, but more a stabilization of the stock at its current levels. And because we have a, a substantial lag in when we see Pacific halibut moving into both our survey and our fishery, um, we have very little information to create precise estimates of recruitment after that 2012 year class. Next slide, please. I will highlight that the 2012 year class, um, as it was um, nine years old in 2021, we would estimate that about 19% of those fish are were, were mature last year. And this is going to be particularly important for the projections moving forward in that the spawning biomass is going to be relying heavily on the maturation of this, this particular year class, noting that in three years time, we would expect just over half of these fish to be mature. So this, this cohort both represents a, a good signal, a positive signal for the stock, uh, but also currently the greatest uncertainty as we are essentially relying on the, the biological dynamics of this, this cohort over the next several years. Next slide, please.
so this figure shows just some summary statistics from this year's assessment uh, with little to highlight other than that um, fishing intensity has been below uh, reference levels. And um, although the spawning biomass has decreased, we do estimate that the stock is still um, above B30%, which is the inflection point in the harvest control rule used by the IPHC, below which we would start to decrease the, the reference level of fishing intensity. Next slide, please. So to summarize the projected effects of the adopted mortality limit for 2022, which was based on the IPHC's reference level of fishing intensity, um, a, a level corresponding to F43%, which is quite consistent with targets used for ground fish uh, on the West Coast and, and in Alaska. We note that there is a relatively high probability that the spawning biomass will continue to decrease over the next several years. However, there's a very low chance that it will decrease by a substantial amount. And what this means for the projections for the fishery is that um, it's essentially a coin toss whether the fishery will be able to be maintained at current levels or whether there will have to be a decrease in fishery catch limits over the next several years. Next slide, please. This figure shows you the projected trend given the, the overall mortality limit set by the commission. Um, and you'll, you see here that the decline in spawning biomass is projected to continue, but at a, a very shallow level. Next slide, please. This uh, last slide uh, just indicates where you could go to find additional information, both the summary document for the IPHC's annual meeting, as well as our website contains uh, more detailed documents similar to your SAFE documents that provides uh, additional background, both on the data sources and the stock assessment methods used for Pacific halibut. And with that, I'm going to turn back to Dr. Hudson Zach, and she'll conclude this presentation. Thank you, Dr. Stewart. With this slide, I will present also a study that IPHC conducted uh, that is economic a study of Pacific Halbud. The goal was to provide stakeholders with an accurate and all sector encompassing assessment of the economic impact of Pacific Halbud resource in both Canada and the United States. The study brings the human dimension to the IPHC research framework, providing a complementary uh, input to optimal management of Pacific halibut that is aligned with uh, IPHC mandate and socioeconomic objectives prevalent in the legislation of Canada and United States. The developed model focuses on Pacific halibut contribution to households that is impact on earnings and income. The figure here summarizes the impact that covers all sectors included in the model, the commercial sector, including processing component, and the charter sector. The multipliers derived from the model are also used to estimate economic impact related to angler expenditures on fishing trips and durable goods, reflecting additional economic impact of the commercial sector, of the, I apologize, of the recreational sector, this including unguided fishing. In the model, employee compensation and profit type of income generate household earnings that are first allocated based on the place of work. Here, that is related to location of fishing activity. Then we assess earnings flow, flows related to quota and permit ownership and residency of Pacific Halbut sector employees. We also estimate that indirect and induced economic impact. The indirect economic impact provides an estimate of the changes related to expenditures on goods and services used in the production process of the directly impacted industries. The induced economic impacts include economic activity that is generated by households spending earnings that rely on Pacific Halibut resource, both directly and indirectly. In this case, uh, the cross-regional flows are generated through imports of uh, inputs to production. What it implies, the incomes as defined in the project are assessed by residency of those who benefit from the resource. Can I please have a next slide? Previous figure represents estimates for 2019, and more typical year in, in the economy. However, we also estimated the, uh, the model for extended time series that includes also 2020. 
These estimates, of course, are highly driven by the impact of, of the pandemic. And the results suggest that Pacific Halbert commercial sector's contribution to households decreased uh, by about 25% between 2019 and 2020. And for more detail about the project, uh, please refer to the report that is available on the IPHC website. On the, you can find it on the meeting website that we linked in this presentation. And can I have now please the next slide? Now I'll also uh, describe the decisions related to IPHC fishery regulations. Uh, the Commission uh, took other decisions related to uh, fishing periods, charter management measures in IPHC regulatory areas 2C and 3A, uh, trap gear use in IPHC regulatory area 2B, that is British Columbia, uh, and I'll also uh, have a few words on the uh, fishery independent satellite survey towards the end. Uh, next slide, please. So the commission adopted fishing periods for 2022 uh, that were uh, the same as those uh, adopted for 2021. So uh, all commercial fishing for Pacific Halwood in IPHC regulatory areas may begin no earlier than 6th of March. So the fishing season already started and must cease on 7th of December. No change was regulated for IPHC regulatory area 2A for 2022. This aligns with the Pacific uh, Fishery Management Council recommendation for the 2022 non-tribal commercial directed halibut fishery in the regulatory area 2A. Next slide, please. The, commis the Commission also adopted charter management measures for IPHC regulatory areas 2C and 3A. Uh, in, the, in area 2C, uh, there is one bag fish, uh, one fish bag limit with size limit of less than or equal to 40 inches or greater than or equal to 80 inches. In IPHC regulatory 3A, there's a two fish bag limit with one fish of any size and a second fish less than or equal to 28 inches. Uh, in this area, there are also Wednesdays and uh, two Tuesdays uh, that are close to retention of Pacific halibut. In this area, there's also a limit of one trip per vessel and one trip per charter halibut permit per day. Uh, this year, there were no uh, annual limits adopted uh, for uh, IPHC regulatory areas to C and 3A. However, the commission also adopted the change to IPHC regulation that establishes record keeping requirement for annual limits if these are introduced in the given year. Thank you. Next slide, please. Uh, the Commission also um, endorsed Optimized Design 1 for 2022 uh, for the Fisheries Independent Sentinel Survey with full sampling of IPHC regulatory areas for CD and E. And this is the map of that uh, uh, of the stations that uh, would be sampled. The Commission also endorsed Optimized Design 2 that includes uh, reduced sampling in uh, for CDNE as an alternative if uh, uh, that would be implemented if necessary. The Commission also endorsed, um, uh, provided provisional endorsement of the designs for 2023 and 2024 that were uh, presented already at the interim meeting earlier or late last year. Next slide, please. Looking ahead from the annual meeting, the Commission accepted the offer by Canada to host the 99th session of the IPHC annual meeting in 2023 in Victoria, British Columbia. And this meeting will be held from 23rd to 27th of January, 2023. However, should the COVID-19 pandemic remain an issue at that time, the meeting might be held again electronically. Since the annual meeting, we also uh, held already the sp uh, special session that included the items that were uh, postponed from the annual meeting to the special session planned for 25th February. During the special session, the Commission discussed the budget for 2023, 
uh, provided additional recommendations on distribution procedures for the management strategy evaluation work that is conducted by the IPHC. The, fishery, uh, the Commission also extended the special exception for the regulatory area 2B, that is British Columbia, that allows the Fisheries and Oceans Canada to increase the daily back limit in for recreational fisheries in this area uh, to free fish should the, uh, the limit, uh, overall limit was uh, expected not to be uh, fully fished until the end of the year. So this is not a, a free fish limit will not apply as a, a default uh, limit, but it is uh, currently an option available to the Fisheries Ocean Canada currently until uh, 31st, of Mar uh, 31st of March 2023. Next, please. Uh, the meeting materials and report are available on the web uh, IPHC website, and here's the link to, to the uh, to the meeting, uh, 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 meeting additional information. Next slide. And with that, uh, I will uh, end the presentation. I am happy to take any additional questions. Uh, thank you. All right, thank you very much for that very comprehensive presentation. I'm sure there may be some questions around the table or from our council members who are participating online. Uh, Marcy Remco. <laughs> thank you, Chair Gronick. Uh, thank you for the presentation. I was uh, looking at slide 20, the economic impact assessment, the impact on households. Um, maybe you can define for us the, the legend there um, or the, the titles, I guess, for each of the categories. I, I'm looking at the far right side. Is that California or is that, what, what is CA and R? Uh, right. Thank you very much for this question. Uh, so uh, to, to provide additional details, the, the first two columns represent Alaska. This, the next two are uh, referring to British Columbia, earnings and income. Uh, then we have the West Coast of the United States, the, including Washington, Oregon, and California. The USR refers to the rest of the US, so all the other states besides Alaska, Washington, Oregon, and California, and CA are re refers to uh, provinces uh, in Canada older than British Columbia. Got it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Further questions? All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. I appreciate the time. Thank you. Of course. Uh, now we will go to our council's representative on the IPHC, or at the IPHC, uh, Phil Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, you have a report that uh, Robin referenced that's in your briefing book that comes uh, from the, uh, the meeting that uh, many of us attended. Let me just start out by saying that as you saw, and as you all know, you know, 2A represents a small segment of the overall um, halibut resource, but that's not to say that halibut aren't very, very important to um, recreational, commercial, and tribal fisheries um, off of our coastline. And so we, um, not surprisingly, we once again had a great uh, representation of our management entities from the tribes, the states, National Marine Fishery Service. And we were once again um, benefited by having several of our key stakeholders who are regular participants in the IPHC process with us. And um, um, the, the successes, if you will, that we've been able to achieve in terms of management for the halibut fishery in Area 2A is uh, largely due to the great representation that we have. This year, uh, for the second year, um, the Halibut Commission 
Secretariat requested that the um, West Coast provide its reports um, in a combined fashion. So where in prior years, the each state um, and National Marine Fisheries Service and, in, and Office of Law Enforcement would provide the commission reports individually uh, these last two years, they've been combined into a single report that's been provided to the commission by the National, by National Marine Fisheries Service. Um, as uh, Dr. Stewart, Stewart indicated, uh, there were some positive signs this year uh, coming out of the stock assessment. Um, he mentioned that the projections for the assessment are, are more optimistic than those from 2019 and 2020, uh, due in large part to the uh, indication that we have a, a relatively strong year class, or it appears that way from 2012. So this is really welcome news. We haven't had a strong year class show up here for a while. So uh, we were really happy to see that. The commission also has a management strategy evaluation program. We're very fortunate that we have some 2A represent representatives um, as part of that process, Maggie Summer, uh, one of those Tom Marking and uh, Scott Mazone from the Quinault Indian Nation, as well as Joe Peterson from the Northwest Indian Fisheries Commission participate uh, in that MSE process that the commission undertook a number of years ago. Of particular interest and importance is that this was the last year of a four-year agreement by the commission that includes an allocation framework um, that provides 2A with a constant exploitation yield of 1.65 million pounds. Um, and that has provided a, a, a good degree of stability for the 2A fisheries over that four year period. Some of us been around, uh, remember that when back when the 2A quotas were under a million down as far as even 700,000 pounds. So having a constant uh, TCUI of 1.65 has been very beneficial um, to us. As, as noted, um, we did have an increase in the non-directed discard mortality in area 2A. So the FCEY, that is the number of pounds that are allocated to the different sectors was reduced slightly. Uh, and while that had a very minimal impact on all of our sectors, the one place where it does have a more meaningful impact is on the incidental catch allowance for the in the sablefish fishery north of Grace Harbor that uh, Robin referenced earlier. Um, the commercial season dates for 2A that were, were a bit of a um, challenge to get through the halibut commission process last year went uh, smooth this year pleased to report and they adopted those as, as was indicated in the commission's report here to you today. We've also been working and we, when I say we as primarily National Marine Fishery Service have been working on the transition of management from IPHC to National Marine Fishery Service for area 2A and the NEMS report, representatives reported out that uh, we're, we're on schedule. There's a proposed rule that's going to be available soon and, tr and the transition is on target for implementation by the start of the 2023 halibut season. Also noted in the uh, commission's presentation here today, there is a reference to annual bag limits. Uh, there was reference to daily bag limits. And I just wanted to caution those that may be listening to this that are participating in the recreational fishery to be sure and consult your regulations that are issued by your states um, and not um, assume that there aren't any annual bag limits as was indicated or that the bag limit in your area, um, you want to make sure you check that out. 
Um, just a couple of, of thank yous. Um, first to Bob Alverson, the, one of the three IPHC commissioners. Bob's always really good about looking out for for 2A. Uh, and Glenn Merrill from National Marine Fishery Service, who is the uh, federal commissioner on the IPHC for the United States, also has been very generous with his time. And Richard Yamada, the other, the third commissioner from Alaska, all three of them have been very generous in providing time to meet with the Area 2A representatives uh, to hear our concerns and advocate for us at the commission table. And lastly, I just wanted to thank Heather Hall, who's uh, my alternate for uh, sitting in um, and helping me out uh, through the week, as did uh, many others that are mentioned um, in the first part of my report uh, from the other states and tribes and National Marine Fisheries Service. Happy to answer any questions, Mr. Chairman. That completes my report. Uh, thank you, Mr. Anderson, and uh, thanks to you for all the time you've you've invested in this on behalf of the council and the anglers, commercial and sport. Are there any questions on Phil's report? Thank you, Phil. All right, I'll put my glasses on and see what's next. All right, um, next we have, I have one report uh, that is from the GAP and the aforementioned Bob Albertson. Welcome, Bob. Yeah, um, are you picking me up? Yeah, we got you, just, uh, yeah, we got you. Okay, thank you. Uh, this is agenda item uh, F1C from the GAP report, GAP report one. The ground fish advisory subpanel received a report from Pacific Fishery Management Council staff, officer Robin Elke and IPHC member myself and others uh, and the, offers the following comments. The GAP appreciates Ms. Elke's and, and myself's presentations and discussion about IPHC meeting and general stock information. Several items specific to Area 2A included the report of a survey of Washington and Southern Oregon for 2022. The 2012 year class is becoming a dominant year class for commercial and recreational catches. This year class is now 19% recruited to the different regulatory areas and the IPHC commissioners uh, will be negotiating regarding the 2B British Columbia harvest rationale and the current 1.65 million pound total constant exploitation yield in 2A will be part of those discussions. Several members of the GAP and public commented that the fixed harvest limit for the last four years has provided better planning for commercial and recreational interest. Members expressed support for this multiple year harvest strategy. Furthermore, the GAP heard from the public and supports the IPHC survey being expanded into Northern California for 2023. It is believed there is substantial increases in abundance in this area from the 2012 year class as fishermen from that area have seen increases in halibut around Eureka and Trinidad. The gap was informed the IPHC is looking at size limits, specifically minimum size limits for 2023. As part of this analysis, the IPHC should consider both the conservation and economic cost and benefits of establishing size limits and include consideration of a maximum size limit in the commercial pot fishery. The GAP urges the IPHC to continue considering size limits in the halibut fishery. Um, the maximum size limit that was recommended to be looked at was uh, the length equivalent of a 75 pound fish um, to give you some context of this paragraph. That concludes our comments, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you very much, Bob. Are there questions of the GAP on the GAP report? Thank you very much, Bob. Yeah. Uh, that concludes uh, reports and presentations, takes us to public comment. I don't see any public comment. So we will turn to our council discussion to consider the reports and provide any guidance as appropriate. 
It, things seem to be going fairly steady here. So let's see what sort of input we may have here. Do we have any guidance to provide? Maybe we don't, things are going pretty well. I, uh, not seeing any hands, I'm gonna to turn to Robin and see how we're doing here. Thank you, Mr. Chair, I think we're doing well. We uh, have a lot of information brought to us. Uh, most of it is uh, informative and good news is most of it is good news, but uh, no decisions here to make. Um, so with that, I think we've uh, done our work under agenda item F1. Uh, Mr. Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm sorry to be slow. Um, as I mentioned in the report, um, the four-year agreement, alloc allocation agreement within the IPHC commission uh, is, this is the last year. And so over the course of the next, well, probably 10 months, um, there's gonna be a process put in place by the commission uh, that, that uh, to revisit that. And it's gonna be important for uh, our area to have a seat at the table, if you will, um, and and uh, track that and provide input as appropriate. So I just wanna, I just wanna highlight that, make the council aware uh, of it, and uh, urge that we, uh, or, and, and ask and, and, and recommend that we provide representation as appropriate when those meetings occur to ensure that area 2A is, is represented. Very good, Phil. I think those are good points for the council to keep in mind and I'm sure we all agree with them and I have to keep that top of mind as the, as the dates approach and be engaged and look to you to provide us some guidance there. All right, let's move on to our last agenda item for the day, agenda item F2, Robin. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Agenda item F2, the incidental catch recommendations. We have the options for the salmon troll and the final recommendations for the fixed gear sable fish fishery. Regulations to govern the incidental harvest of the Pacific Camps halibut and the salmon troll fishery and the primary fixed gear fishery for sable fish north of Point Chehalis require the council to adopt halibut landing restrictions to allow incidental harvest while assuring quotas are not exceeded. For the salmon troll fishery, the catch sharing plan allocates 15% of the non-Indian commercial halibut allocation uh, to this salmon troll fishery as incidental catch. The objective outlined in the catch sharing plan is to harvest the quota during the April through June salmon troll fishery with the secondary objective to harvest the balance of the quota from July through the remainder of the salmon troll fishery. The council has used landing ratios and trip limits uh, to manage the progression of the fishery in past years and a summary of that information is provided in agenda item, uh, this agenda item under attachment one. And also, unless revised, the incidental halibut landing restrictions in the commercial salmon troll fishery adopted for 2021 prior to any in-season action will be in effect when incidental halibut retention opens in April 2022. The 21 rela uh, regulations are no more than one halibut per two Chinook, although one halibut may be possessed or landed without meeting the ratio requirement and no more than 35 halibut may be landed per trip. So under this agenda item, the council should confirm or recommend any in-season changes to those retention limits, which will remain in place until we remain in place until replaced by the new limits adopted for the salmon management measures beginning May 16, 2022. Also under this agenda item, the council should adopt for public review a range of incidental halibut landing restrictions for the commercial salmon troll fishery beginning May 16, 2022 and continue and continuing uh, into April 1 through May 15th, 2023. Such restrictions should comport to the salmon management alternatives during the same time frames. The council is scheduled to take final action on these limits at the upcoming April council meeting. For the primary sable fish fishery north of Point 
Chehalis, the total area to a halibut quota is large enough to provide for an incidental harvest. And this fishery is allocated a portion of the Washington sport allocation, which is consistent with all the numbers there you see um, under given the FCEY. Um, this year, the FCEY is less than the 1.5 million pounds. So the maximum is 50,000 pounds for this particular fishery this year. The objectives of the landing restrictions are to attain the halibut allocation at about the same time the sablefish fishery ends on October 31, and to ensure equitable sharing of the halibut landings among the fishers. And again, as in past years, the council has used the landing restrictions to make sure that harvest remains within the allocation. And attachment one uh, shows the uh, restrictions in place uh, in past years since that fissure be began. Uh, the incidental landing limits allowed would be consistent with those in place when the fishery last closed in 2021, which was a landing ratio of 225 pounds, dressed weight for halibut for every 1,000 pounds dressed weight of sablefish landed, and up to two additional halibut in, in excess of the ratio requirement. So under this agenda item, the council should confirm or make recommendations to modify the landing limits for the sablefish fishery north of Point Chehalis starting April 1 through October 31, 2022. And attachment two provides um, the information from the IPHC announcing um, application deadlines for licenses needed to participate in the halibut uh, area 2A fisheries in 2022. I also want to make a correction. Um, on page two of attachment one for that sablefish fishery for the 2022 line. Unfortunately, the 70,000 number is incorrect. It is actually 50,000 um, fish allocated to that fishery uh, for 2022, as we've discussed. So for the council action under this agenda item is to recommend any in-season changes to the halibut landing restrictions in the salmon troll fishery that are set to begin April 1 and continue through May 15. I recommend those changes as necessary and then adopt for public review a range of options for the halibut landing restrictions in the salmon troll fishery beginning May 16. 22 and for April 1 through May 15, 2023 and adopt final halibut landing restrictions for the fixed gear sablefish fishery north of Point Chehalis for the 2022 season beginning April 1. And again, your reference materials, you have the attachments one and two. You also have uh, advisory body reports from the SAS, the GAP, and the GMT. And I think that concludes my summary. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, Robin. Let's see if there are any questions of Robin on the overview she provided. All right, don't see any hands. So we will move into the reports we have here. We have three reports. Uh, we'll start with the Salmon Advisory Subpanel. Good afternoon, council members, council staff. My name is Mark Newell. I'm a salmon advisory guy for Morgan this month. I'm a salmon fisherman buyer processor out of Newport, Oregon, also on the Oregon Salmon Commission and the Pacific Salmon Commission Southern Panel. The salmon advisory subpanel recommends the following alternatives for public review. All alternatives are from the time period of May 16th, 2022 through the end of 2022 salmon troll fishery and the beginning of April 1st, 2023 until modified through in-season action or superseded by 2023 management measures. <clears throat> Alternative one, status quo. License holders may land no more than one Pacific halibut per each two Chinook except for one Pacific halibut may be landed without meeting the ratio requirement and no more than 35 halibut landed per trip. 
Alternative two, license holders may land no more than one Pacific halibut per two Chinook, except one halibut may be landed without meeting the ratio requirement and no more than 30 halibut per landed per trip. Alternative three, license holders may land no more than one Pacific halibut per two Chinook, except one Pacific halibut may be landed without meeting the ratio requirement and no more than 25 halibut landed per trip. Incidental Pacific halibut catch regulations in the commercial salmon troll fishery may be modified by in season action. The SAS recommends that the current incidental Pacific halibut catch regulations remain for the period April 1st through May 15th, 2022. The current limit is no more than one halibut per each two Chinook, except one halibut may be possessed or landed without meeting the ratio requirement and no more than 35 halibut may be landed per trip. Thank you very much, Mark. Are there questions of the SAS on the report? Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, we have a gap report from Bob Alverson. Welcome, Bob. Yes, uh, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Agenda item F2A, uh, ground fish advisory report on incidental catch. The uh, ground fish advisory sub panel received a report from Pacific Fishery Management Council staff officer Robin Elke and reviewed the reports under this agenda item and offers the following recommendations. Incidental catch in the salmon troll fisheries as in the past, the gap defers to the salmon advisory sub panel regarding recommendations for halibut retention in the salmon troll fishery for 2022. Incidental catch in the fixed gear sablefish fisheries uh, regarding the primary tiered sablefish fishery north of Point Chehalis, Washington. The GAP recommends the incidental catch be set at 150 pounds of halibut per 1,000 pounds of dressed sablefish plus two halibut. In 2021, the halibut rate was 225 pounds of halibut per 1,000 pounds of dressed sablefish in order to fill an allocation of 70,000 pounds. The allocation in 2022 will be reduced to 50,000 pounds. In 2018, when the allocation level was also 50,000 pounds, the catch rate was set at 140 pounds of halibut for 1,000 pounds of sable fish, resulting in a landing of 43,000 pounds of halibut. The GAP believes 150 pounds of halibut for 1,000 pounds of dressed sable fish should result in an incidental harvest close to the 50,000 pound allocation. That, that concludes our comments. Thank you very much, Bob. Are there questions of Bob? Thank you, Bob. Yep. And now we will hear from uh, the ground fish management team. I think it's Whitney Roberts. Welcome. Do we have someone from the ground fish management team? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, my audio has been glitching a little bit, so I apologize. We got you now. Welcome. I apologize if, uh, if I miss something. If there are any questions, um, I think you just called on the GMT, so I will go ahead. My ask you. Okay, great, thank you. Apologies if there's any audio issues. I'm getting an indication that there may be poor internet connection, um, but I will, I will try to charge through. My name is Whitney Roberts from the Ground Fish Management Team. I will be reading agenda item F2A, Supplemental GMT Report 1 on the um, incidental cash recommendations, options for salmon troll, and final action on recommendations for fixed gear stable fish fisheries. The Ground Fish Management Team Team reviewed the briefing book materials, specifically page two of attachment one on incidental Pacific halibut retention in the primary fixed year stable fish fishery north of Point Chehalis, Washington, and discussed the issue with members of the ground fish, ground fish advisory sub panel. It is the GMT's understanding that the incidental Pacific halibut allocation to the primary fixed year stable fish fishery will decrease from 70,000 pounds to 50,000 pounds in 2022 
due to a reduction in the fishery catch exploitable yield, warranting a reduction in the Pacific halibut for stable fish landing limit to avoid exceeding the allocation. GMT projections estimate that under the status quo landing limit of 225 pounds of Pacific halibut for 1,000 pounds of stable fish, the fishery will catch 66,474 pounds of Pacific halibut in 2022. The gap is requesting and the GMT supports a landing limit of 150 pounds of Pacific halibut dress weight for 1,000 1, pounds of stable fish plus two additional Pacific halibut. This is similar to the limit that was in place in 2018. In other words, 140 pounds of Pacific halibut. The last time the allocation was set at 50,000 pounds. At the 150 pound Pacific halibut landing limit, the GMT projections estimate that the fishery will catch 55,776 pounds in 2022. While this projection exceeds the 50,000 pound allocation, Actual landings in 2018 were 43,716 pounds under a 140-pound landing limit, or 87% of the 50,000-pound allocation. Additionally, the GMT projections used 2021 as a reference year, during which the allocation was 70,000 pounds and the landing limit was 225 pounds, meaning that the projections likely overestimate expected landings in 2022 Lowering the limit from 225 pounds to 150 pounds is likely to reduce the incentive for vessels to seek out ground that are productive of, for both stable fish and Pacific halibut, thereby likely reducing overall Pacific halibut catch beyond what is projected. The final date in 2022 for retention of incidental halibut in all commercial fisheries is specified by the International Pacific Halibut Commission, IPHC, in December 7. However, the primary stable fish fishery is required to cease retention of Pacific halibut at the end of the season, currently October 31, to monitor incidental landings of Pacific halibut by the primary stable fish fishery north of Point Chihuahua, Washington, and ensure that the allocation is not exceeded. The Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife provides weekly landings updates to IPHC throughout the season. If the allocation is exceeded or projected to be exceeded, IPHC may require that vessels cease retention of Pacific halibut. And that concludes the GMC report, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much for that report. Are there any questions of the GMT? I'm not seeing any questions. Thank you very much. Uh, that concludes reports. Uh, I don't have any public comment. So that'll take us to our council discussion and action. And uh, this is an agenda item that will require motions. So let's start with any uh, discussion. We, we can perhaps take them one by one, unless someone has, uh, prefers another approach. Um, first has to do with recommended in-season changes in the, in the salmon troll fishery. I think we have a recommendation that there not be an in-season change, but that's what the SAS recommended. What does the council say? I think the council is fine with that unless I hear otherwise. Uh, Heather Hall. I have a motion to offer on this. Um, on on or, the first action here? Yes. Yes. Okay, Heather, please that. go ahead. Okay. All right. I move that the council adopt for public review the alternatives presented in agenda item F2A. Supplemental SAS Report 1, March 2022, for halibut landing restrictions in the salmon troll fishery in 2022, beginning May 16th, and for April 1 through May 15th, 2023. And recommend no change to the current incidental Pacific halibut retention limits for April 1 through May 15th of 2022. Uh, thank you, Heather. The language on there is correct on the screen is correct just want to yes, get a verbal confirmation yes it is thank you all right thank you is there a second seconded by phil anderson uh please speak to your motion sure thank you um the uh motion uh as it states, follows along the recommendation in the SAS report. It confirms that there are no changes needed for the um, retention limits that are in place now through May 15th of this year, and also provides um, the council and the public a range of alternatives um, for review that are, are appropriate based on the salmon discussions that are underway. Um, I think 
that covers it. Thank you. All right. Are there any uh, questions for Heather on her motion? Is there any discussion on the motion? All right, I'm not seeing any hands. So uh, I will call the question. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Abstentions? The motion passes unanimously. Thank you, Heather, for the motion. Uh, let's go back to our list of actions here. I think that might have taken care of one and two. So let's go to number three here. This has to do with the fixed gear sablefish fishery north of Point Chehalis and see if there's any discussion here or a motion. Heather Hall. Thank you. Um, Chair Grelnick, I, I can start with a little bit of discussion here, and then I do have a motion as well. Um, as was mentioned in the IPHC report and then followed up again uh, in the GAP report, uh, the Sablefish Fishery north of Point Chehalis, uh, the allocation for that dropped from 70,000 pounds um, to 50,000 pounds this year. So I appreciate the work that the GMT did to explore that and, and um, provide the council with some information. I also appreciate their coordination with the GAP and um, looking at what a reasonable um, landing ratio might be um, for us uh, as we contemplate what the, that limit might be. Any uh, further discussion? Why don't you uh, proceed with your motion, All please? Right. I move that the council adopt a final trip limit ratio of 150 pounds of Pacific halibut per 1,000 pounds of sablefish plus two additional Pacific halibut for the primary sablefish fishery north of Point Chehalis, Washington, as recommended in the supplemental GMT report under agenda item F2A, March 2022. The language on the screen is uh, accurate and complete. Yes, it is. Thank you. I'll look for a second. Seconded by Phil Anderson. Thank you, Phil. Please speak to your motion. Thank you. Um, as I mentioned, the GMT in their report, they explored the last time the allocation to this uh, sector was at the 50,000 pound level. Um, so this recommendation of 150 pounds for the land landing limit, um, while it may go over based on the projections that the D GMT did, I think they the GMT did a good job of explaining that um, the actual landings um, in 2018 under the same allocation were a little bit below that. Also would note here that um, uh, we do track catch in this fishery um, weekly on a weekly basis. There's opportunity to take in season action if these projections are uh, not following along the expectation of the GMT. Um, so we, there's a, a safety net there in that regard. Um, yeah, that's it. Thank you. All right, thank you. Are there any uh, questions for Heather or discussion on the motion? All right, not uh, seeing any enthusiasm for that. Let's take a vote. I'll call the question. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Abstentions? The motion passes unanimously. Before I turn back uh, to Robin to see if there's anyone on the floor here or in our virtual uh, world, council members have any other discussion or action on this agenda item? All right, Robin, how are we doing on F2? Doing very well. Thank you, Mr. Chair. It looks like you've completed your action under this agenda item. We have three options for uh, halibut retention in the salmon troll fishery ready to move forward for public review. And we've made a final action on the uh, limits for the sablefish fishery. Um, so with that, I think we've done everything under F2. Thank you. 
All right, thank you very much, Robin. Um, then I think that completes our agenda items for the day. And I'll note that it is 457. So somehow, some way, we're on schedule, which is pretty remarkable considering how we started the day. Uh, before we break for the day, I'll turn to our executive director for any announcements. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, congratulations, everyone, on a great uh, day today and uh, catching up here right on time at the, uh, the five o'clock hour. I would uh, just point out quickly that we do have a, uh, a reception waiting for you outside um, starting at 6 p.m. Um, so to get there, if you're interested, head down the stairs, go out the doors that way, and you can't miss it. So again, that starts at 6 p.m. Um, that's the only announcement I have at the moment. Mr. Chairman, so back to you. All right, well, uh, enjoy your time off here. <laughs> and we'll be back at it at eight o'clock in the morning and we'll be starting with Sam and see y'all later. Thanks. Mm -hmm.